do a quick introduction. My name is Ryan Bartling. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I've worked on herring for quite a while, and the project lead for the department on this particular area of the country. Um, Sarah Valenci is here. She's a contractor that's uh, been hired to develop and help draft the fishery management plan. Um, one of her uh, partners will be joining us a little bit later. He's coming up from Monterey, David Crabb. We'll try to quickly introduce him when he comes in. Um, she also has a third project member, um, Elf McGonagall, who's based down in Santa Barbara, is helping with some, some of the technical and uh, legal parts of the background of that fishery management plan. Um, we have also uh, other department staff here, Lieutenant Jim Jones. We've got uh, Warden Clarison and Warden Pika. I just want to make sure I got that. Um, so what we're going to do, Sarah's going to run through a presentation. Uh, then we'll, we're going to try to hold public comments and questions to the end. And we'll probably, just to make sure that it's captured, we're actually recording this, and we'll be able to make it available on YouTube. We'll probably at least have you come forward so that we can make sure we capture it on the microphone. Um, just some quick ground rules, just if you could please silence your cell phones um, if you haven't done that already. You know, be courteous to everyone in the room. I think we're all going to get along and have a great day, but just have to say that. Um, try to keep, you know, side conversations to a minimum. There's not a lot of us, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. And then, of course, you know, respect everybody's point of view. Um, I think that is it as far as getting us started. Again, if you haven't uh, had a chance, you could just sign in. Um, that would be great, and that would, gives us the opportunity to communicate with you or at least give you updates. We can also report back to the Fishing Game Commission uh, that we had, did have some attendees and that we have had a certain amount of public interest in this particular topic. So, unless I've missed something, public comment. public comment. We'll try to hold it to the end. Um, if for some reason you need to leave early and you can't wait till the very end, we do have some comment cards over there. Please feel free to use those. Depending on the amount of comments that we feel like we'll have, we may have to organize it when David gets here and, and just go off comment cards and have to do that. But we'll, we'll kind of play by ear at this point because we are a, a bit of a smaller group. That's okay. 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 I will turn over to Sarah. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so as Ryan said, my name is Sarah Valencia. Um, I have a PhD in fishery science, and so I was hired by the department to assist them with developing this fishery management plan. And so we're really excited today to share with you all of the work that has gone into developing this plan um, and to, to get some comments um, from the public about, um, about the plan. Um, and that feedback will be taken into account as we sort of finalize the plan and move forward with the process. So, um, so just to give a little bit of background, the Marine Life Management Act, um, which is the uh, law that governs how fisheries are managed in California, requires that um, all fisheries be managed in a way that promotes stock, stock sustainability, stakeholder engagement, and a holistic ecosystem-based approach. And so this is our guiding principle for developing a management plan for this fishery. Um, and so, um, the Marine Life Management Act also requires that fishery management plans be developed for all of California's fisheries. And so a, a, a fishery management plan, or an FMP, um, is a document that provides a comprehensive overview of everything we know about the fishery. So um, all the data that's been collected, what we know biologically about the stock, um, the history of the fishery and how management has evolved over time, the socioeconomics of the fishery, um, et cetera. It also describes where the major uncertainties lie, you know, areas where more research is needed um, in order to make, make better management decisions. And then it lays out a comprehensive management procedure for um, actually making management decisions each year. So, and, you know, the idea behind this is that um, so it provides guidance to the California um, Fish and Wildlife staff you know, so that whoever comes next after Ryan and his team, you know, has, um, has a, you know, a document that describes, you know, what, 
what are the basis for management decisions, how should those decisions be made, what data needs to be collected. Um, and it also provides transparency for the public so that they, you know, for, for fishermen, for recreational fishers, for general interested public, so that everyone can understand, okay, this is how this fishery is managed. Um, and so it provides a, a mechanism for transparency and accountability for the department. Um, and so additionally, it's paired with a regulatory package to implement the FMP. So I'm gonna be talking about um, today, so I'm gonna be providing some background on the FMP development process to date. Um, I'm gonna describe the scientific analyses that, um, that underpin our proposed management plan and some of their key findings. Um, and then I'm going to present to you our proposed management plan for um, for San Francisco Bay and for the other invadements where herring is fished in California. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have this opportunity to rewrite regulations. So I will be um, talking about some of the proposed regulatory changes for this fishery. And then I will give a brief um, overview of what the next steps are in the FMP development process. And then we'll, we'll try and you know, save the comment period until after that. So, for this, you know, a little background about this fishery. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to just give a really quick overview of, of you know, how this fishery got started and, and where it came from, because it provides good context for why we made some of the management decisions, you know, that we made going forward with this, this proposed plan. So just as background, herring are um, a small, highly productive, um, highly variable pelagic fish. Um, they are primarily live their life in big schools out in, in the open ocean, but they come into bays and estuaries to lay their eggs. And so, um, you know, San Francisco Bay and other bays in, in Northern California um, are key spawning habitats for, um, for Pacific herring. And so we have a fishery that began in the 1970s um, targeting herring roe. So they're looking, they're basically trying to um, collect the egg sac from um, herring. And that fishery developed in response uh, to um, demand from Japan. So herring roe is a delicacy in Japan. So we have a fishery that targets these herring when they come into the bay um, for this very brief winter spawning period. So our management approach has been to try to balance you know, um, our sort of key objectives. You know, we want, uh, we want an economically viable and productive fishery, but we also want to make sure that the um, herring are protected at this key time in their life cycle when they're, you know, when they're reproducing. We want to make sure that um, enough herring gets to spawn such that we can ensure that we have a sustainable herring stock for many, many years to come. Um, additionally, herring are um, a noted uh, forage species for predators in California, um, you know, specifically uh, harbor seals and sea lions within the bay, many birds, other marine mammals, and other fish species. So um, we also need to think about their needs for forage and ensure that our management approach um, incorporates that as well. So. Um, there are four major areas where herring are fished. And so San Francisco Bay is, has been the biggest in terms of landings and participants, but herring um, have also in the past been fished in Tomales Bay, and then to a lesser extent up in Humboldt Bay and Crescent City. So um, a, lot of, a lot of what we'll be talking about today is from San Francisco Bay because that's where we have the most information, but we will touch on management going forward in these other areas. So um, just to give you a sense of, of where we've been in this fishery, um, this shows the landings um, and the estimated biomass since the late 70s. Um, and so the fishery actually started a few years before that, but um, this shows a time period from when we had a pretty consistent data collection protocol in place. And, um, and so what you can see here is that the estimated herring biomass, which is this darker blue color, um, fluctuates wildly from year to year. And, um, you know, then, and then we have um, our landings, which were um, much higher in the past and have been a smaller percentage of the total biomass um, uh, in more recent years. And that's largely due to more precautionary management. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But so this fishery, you know, got started in the 70s. It really, um, 
it uh, grew quite a lot in the 80s and 90s. And so by the mid 90s, there were 450 permits in this fishery. Um, and the uh, um, annual revenue was around $20 million. It was one of California's most valuable fisheries. Um, and so, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, a number of different management changes took place um, because there was concern about, you know, poten the potential for overexploitation, um, you know, issues related to space, you know, um, within the Bay, because this is San Francisco Bay, it's not a huge area to have, you know, this many participants. So, um, um, and one of the major changes came in response to a recommendation by um, some external scientists who did a, 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 um, a peer review of California's management in, um, in the early 2000s. And so um, the primary way that this fishery is managed is via a quota. So a quota is a catch limit. Um, it, basically the department each year says, this is how much herring you can take and when that level is reached, the fishery is closed. Um, and so it's been widely recognized that a 20% harvest rate, so that's 20% of the available adult stock, um, is a sustainable harvest rate. That's what's used in, in many other um, areas where Pacific herring are caught. So Pacific herring fisheries exist. Basically, you know, we're, we're actually the most southern here in California, um, but in Oregon and Washington, British Columbia, and up in Alaska, they're all um, Pacific herring fisheries as well. And so, um, you know, for a long time, the state pursued this, um, you know, a, a harvest rate when they would set their quotas, they would try to target a harvest rate that was, you know, below this 20% and, and around 15 um, for a number of years. But then in, in, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s in response to, uh, you know, being a little bit concerned about the herring fishery, um, it was decided that, um, it was recommended that a um, maximum harvest rate of 10% be, um, be used instead. And so you can see this real shift in this, um, in this graph. In, you know, during that time period. And since then, harvest rates have not been above 10% and have, um, for the last few years, really been, you know, um, quotas have been set to, to achieve harvest rates that are more in line with 5%. And so um, this, this management approach, this precautionary management approach um, is really, you know, one of, one of our goals for this fishery management plan is to, um, to document this approach and to codify it going forward. So, because we think that, um, you know, harvest rates between five and 10% um, seem very precautionary, precautionary, have been working. And um, so that's sort of one of the key principles as we move forward that we're gonna be um, trying to achieve. And then, you know, because this fishery was so, um, you know, was a high value, high participant fishery, you know, we've had a long, um, a long data collection uh, um, process for this fishery. So monitoring began in the 1970s. That means that we have um, long-term data sets which have been really valuable in um, creating this FMP. So, you know, I just put this slide up to show that the state of California really has, um, has a very robust monitoring program in place for this fishery in San Francisco. And um, it's a very data-rich data fishery for California. And so we've been really utilizing as much of that information as possible in, um, in our analyses uh, related to the development of this process. So the FMP process, um, so as I said, you know, one of the primary goals is to codify this precautionary management going forward. Um, so the FMP process actually began about five years ago, and a group of interested um, interested parties composed of some representatives from um, the conservation community, so um, from Audubon and from Oceana, and um, some members from industry, so um, some longtime fishermen from the gillnet fleet, um, and then uh, biologists uh, and managers from the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife began getting together and having these discussions about, okay, you know, what, if we were to have 
an FMP process because it is a very large process. Once the state decides it's going to draft a management plan for a fishery, um, it's, it is a, a long and time consuming process. It takes up a lot of the department's resources um, because they need to collect and analyze all available data, do you know, additional new analyses, and then have this you know, sort of fairly comprehensive public outreach process to try and incorporate stakeholder feedback. Um, so this discussion group began um, talking about, okay, if we were to open an FMP process, what would the goals for that process be? You know, what kind of, what do we want to see? And so this is actually pretty unique for um, management plans in California. So previous FMPs, um, you know, have basically been initiated by the department and then they start bringing in other stakeholders. This process is really benefited by having these sort of background discussions that, you know, um, that basically laid out a blueprint for this FMP process. Um, and so that, that, that discussion group evolved and they eventually became a steering committee. Um, and so they also helped the department to um, raise funds to offset some of the burden of, you know, from department staff of having to write this FMP all by themselves. So they then hired my team to um, really take on the bulk of the um, management and production work for the FMP. Um, and so my team has been overseen every step of the way by this steering committee. And so that's just one way that we've had a lot of um, stakeholder feedback from these diverse groups um, guiding this plan as we've built it. Um, so in this blueprint that the, um, that the steering committee uh, created, you know, we wanted a, a comprehensive management plan that um, achieves a few key goals. So one of them is to do, establish a formal decision-making process that the department has to follow every year when they're setting quotas. Um, and so it basically, you know, an FMP will describe, you know, what information should they take into account, how should that information be considered, um, and what are the appropriate management tools that can be used. Um, you know, they wanted that, um, that formal decision-making process to ensure the sustainability of the stock, and to be, but also to be um, responsive to both environmental fluctuations as well as socioeconomic fluctuations. Um, and then, as I mentioned um, previously, we really want to formally consider the role of herring as a forage fish. And so that's um, a little bit unique because uh, previous management plans in California have really focused on, you know, primarily on stock sustainability. And so um, with this herring FMP, we have a new opportunity to um, really embrace this, you know, sort of more holistic ecosystem-based management approach for, for this fishery. So that's kind of just a background of, you know, how we got to where we are. So we, the, my team was hired, let's see, about Let's see, 20 months ago. And so we have been, been working on this project for almost two years. And um, so we have conducted um, extensive analyses of all the available information. And so I'm gonna share with you um, the results of three primary analyses that really underpin our proposed management plan. And so I'm gonna go through them pretty briefly, but just so you have an idea of the kinds of information that we've used and the kinds of analyses that have been done. And then I'm gonna, actually show you what is our proposed plan for making decisions in this fishery. So, um, yeah, so remember, we, you know, we have these sort of, these dual goals of incorporating the best available science, but also taking into account stakeholder input. Um, so, um, you know, we have conducted these scientific analyses. Some of them were done by my team. We also um, worked with the Farallon Institute, um, which is a, um, a scientific group in this area that is um, you know, probably the leaders in uh, thinking about ecosystem-based management for the California current. And so, um, we, uh, so they did some of this work for us. And, but um, throughout this process, we have had you know, sort of the scientific analysis and then we take the results to the steering committee and they provide oversight and guidance. And um, so, you know, we've been basically having this back and forth um, process with them this whole time. So 
when we, this analysis of historical data, you know, we looked at all of the different time series available for this fishery and for San Francisco Bay, there was quite a lot of them. Um, you know, and we also looked at other environmental um, data that were, that are routinely collected in San Francisco Bay, um, because we know that herring are, um, are highly influenced by environmental conditions like, um, like sea surface temperature and um, uh, rainfall and um, you know turbidity in the water and things like that. So we wanted to see you know are there correlations? And so by correlations, you know can we find some pattern of when you know one of these environmental indices is high, herring the herring population is also high, or the herring population is low? And you know can we find a pattern that tracks over the time series that we've been looking at? Um, because those things are really helpful in, um, in, in under, better understanding how herring are responding to their environmental fluctuations, and it helps the department take a more proactive management approach, you know, because, you know, if we're only collecting data on the fish itself, we can say, oh, you know, we have a mechanism of detecting when, you know, when the stock might be low or when the stock might be high and making, you know, making a management decision based on that. But if we can, um, more proactively look for these sort of environmental correlations, then that gives the department a method to say, to uh, more proactively make decisions and say, okay, we think this year might be, you know, might be uh, uh, not very good conditions for herring. So we are going to preemptively, you know, set a lower quota um, to be more precautionary. So there's a lot of data. And so we looked at a number of different potential indicators. And so, um, you know, this is a list of all the environmental indicators we looked at. This is all the potential herring response variables that we looked at. And I'm not gonna go through it, but I just want to let you know that we really did a very, pretty comprehensive look at, you know, all the, all the data we could get our hands on. And so, you know, we actually were able to discover strong correlations between, um, you know, basically this herring egg deposition. So what you know, uh, the primary um, indicator of stock status that the department monitors is how many eggs are laid in the seagrass, in the eelgrass um, each, each season when the herring come into San Francisco Bay to, to spawn. And so they use that number to then back calculate, okay, how many fish must have been in the population to lay this many eggs? And so um, there were strong correlations between this, you know, amount of eggs and the, um, the, um, some of these environmental indicators. And so um, we then used this information to create a predictive model to try and estimate next year's stock size. Um, and so this is a real important opportunity for management of herring. So let me explain how we currently estimate spawning stock um, size biomass, and then I will describe this new predictive model. So currently, as I mentioned, um, Ryan and his team, they, um, during the winter spawning season, you'll see them out in the bay doing surveys. And so they first map all the vegetation in the bay that is, you know, good potential herring spawning habitat. And then um, when they track the spawns as they come in. So um, when a wave of a school of herring come in and they start to spawn, Ryan and his team will go and they will actually um, sort of uh, sample in a, a formulaic way to try and get some estimate of the approximate area of the spawn and the density of the spawn. And they use that to produce this number that is you know, the number of herring eggs laid per spawn and then they sort of do that for all the spawns and they get um, a biomass for the season. And so previously in setting quotas, they've looked at, okay, how many eggs were spawned last year? What was the herring biomass associated with that? And how many did we catch? And they add those numbers together to get a estimate of, okay, we know that there were this many herring in the bay last year. And they set next year's quota based on last year's biomass. So um, this, this method, while it has, you know, proven to be successful over the, you know, 40 plus years of this fishery, um, it can result in some years where last year's biomass looks nothing like next year's biomass because, you know, as I mentioned, herring, they, you know, respond a lot uh, to environmental conditions and they are known to, to fluctuate um, wildly in population size because they're sort of um, short-lived, highly, pro highly productive species. So there have been times in the past where the quota set based on last year's season is actually either too high or too low 
for the coming year season. Um, and so this, this new predictive model that has been developed, um, it actually uses three indicators to produce an estimate of what the herring stock size will be in the coming year. So it uses that same spawn you know, deposition number from the previous year, so how many eggs were observed last year. But it also incorporates um, the number of young of the year. So this is juveniles um, or recruits to the fisheries, um, another term that is used, from three years prior. So the department, in addition to the work that Ryan's team does to monitor this stock during the season, the department also has a team that is just generally taking water samples from the bay all year long. And so from that, um, that monitoring process, we get estimates of the number of juvenile herring observed um, in the bay throughout the year. And so primarily, so a um, little bit about the herring life cycle, um, herring come in in the winter, they lay their eggs. Those eggs tend to hatch after about 10 days or so. And, um, and then those juveniles sort of float around in the bay um, for a while, and then they begin to make their way out to the open ocean in the summer, so around August, September. Um, so that count of the number of juveniles in the bay during those summer months is, has proven to be a really useful indicator for um, basically for what the productivity of the stock is three years later because we think that, um, you know, herring mature between two and three years. And um, so it's, it's primarily three, three year olds and older that are coming back as the spawning stock um, each year to lay their eggs. So, and then another, um, so we looked at a number of different um, climate indicators, but um, one of the best ones for use in management was this um, summer sea surface temperature out of the Farallon Islands. And so that's sort of an indicator of, you know, of, of current conditions right before the season starts, you know, which may influence, you know, um, how many herring come back into the bay to spawn. So these three pieces of information are combined into this predictive model. And, um, and so the statistical analysis has shown that this model is basically has a higher predictive power than just last year's um, spawning deposition alone. And if we, were to, if we were previously to have used it to set quotas, um, on average, it would have been um, more accurate than the method that the department currently uses. So um, moving forward, this predictive model is currently undergoing peer review, but department scientists find it pretty promising and are excited about um, potentially using it as a new method of estimating um, spawning stock biomass to set quotas going forward. Um, but additionally, you know, as we write up the FMP, we will ensure that the method that the department has always used um, is still, will still be a viable method for estimating quota should, um, should something change in the future. You know, should um, data no longer be available or should these correlations, which are based on, you know, um, sort of the current climate scenario, if they break down in the future, the department will have this fallback, um, going back to the method they've always used to manage this stock. So, so that's one of the key analyses underpinning our, um, our proposed management framework. So the next one is to develop and test a harvest control rule. So as I mentioned, one of the major goals of this um, FMP was to create this predetermined mechanism for setting yearly quotas. And so there were a couple of different reasons for that. One is that the, the way that the department has set quotas previously is, you know, as I mentioned, they've generally followed this, gui this guideline of, you know, below 20% historically, and then, you know, in sort of the, the more recent last 15 years or so of the fishery, you know, 10% or below. But how that decision is made every year is, is unclear. Um, and so, um, you know, having sort of a predetermined rule will increase transparency and also hopefully um, uh, decrease the amount of arguing that goes on over what the quota should be each year. Um, additionally, there's a lot of work that goes into setting quotas currently. In addition to all of the monitoring that the department does, they have then needed to um, propose this, this 
quota to the commission and go through this sort of extended commission approval process. And um, so one of the behind the scenes thing that uh, this FMP hopes to accomplish is moving that control over the quota within the department so that they have the power to set it each year following this pre-approved guidelines um, and to reduce the amount of work related with having the commission approve it each year. Um, so in order to develop and test the harvest control rule, we used a, um, a simulation procedure called management strategy evaluation. And we use that to look at a, a wide number of potential harvest control rules. And so what I mean by harvest control rules is a predefined formula that says if the spawning stock biomass is this, then the quota should be this. And so there's a number of different functional forms that relationship can take. And so we looked at a number, a, a, a very large number of um, different ways that that could be done. And we also looked at that under a wide range of uncertainties because while this is a fairly data rich fishery, there's still in all fisheries, there are lots of things we don't know that we wish we did. And so, um, so we did extensive simulation testing to understand the performance of each candidate harvest control role, not just under, you know, not just under historical conditions, not just under sort of ideal conditions, but also under um, some, you know, potential uh, um, scenarios where product productivity might be depressed for a long time or things like that. Um, because we, you know, our goal was to create a harvest control role that is, um, that is is robust to all of these various uncertainties to say even if you know we don't know what's going to happen next we're pretty confident that this harvest control rule is going to work well so i mentioned this term management strategy evaluation before i describe what that is i just want to describe what i mean by the word management strategy because that's really what we're building with this fmp and so a management strategy primarily has three different pieces so one of them is the data collection protocol how do you monitor the impact that fishing is having on the stock? Um, and you know, for this fishery, how do you know when the quota has been reached? So all of that requires data collection. So that's one piece of, the, of a management strategy. The next piece is how is that data that's collected analyzed in order to get some estimate of stock status? Um, and so, you know, normally with the way fisheries are managed, you may have heard the term stock assessment. That's um, a common way that the, um, all this data that's collected from, you know, from fishery, fishery monitoring is analyzed. And then it gives some estimate of what the current stock size is. Um, but there are a number of different analyses that could potentially fall under this, this portion of a management strategy. And then the last piece is this harvest control rule, which is how do you take whatever number came out of your stock analysis and, um, and then make a decision that governs fishing in the coming year. So you need all of those three pieces to have a management strategy. And you'll notice that this management strategy is iterative because all of these things happen every year and we get new information every year. And so when we are trying to test these harvest control rules via simulation, we need to incorporate that aspect of it um, over time. So that's what we've done. I'm just going to pause to um, introduce David Crabb, who um, we're glad you made it. Um, and so David has been a really helpful member of this team. He um, has a history as a commercial fisherman, and he's worked in a number of different public processes for fisheries decisions, including at the, the federal level with the um, Pacific uh, Fisheries Management Council. And so David has a lot of experience helping to run meetings. So um, he'll basically be, you know, during the public comment period or if there are questions, just trying to sort of make sure that everything is noted down and that we kind of keep the uh, conversation on track and moving forward. Um, okay, so just to sum up this, um, so these are the pieces that we're putting together and, and testing in this um, computer simulation. And so we built this big computer model that um, basically is a probabilistic model that will tell us what is the expected performance of each of these given um, the, the harvest control rules that we're testing. Um, and so um, we then evaluate model performance based on these performance measures 
that um, reflect management objectives. And so again, I said that this whole process has been this interplay between science and, and you know, um, stakeholder feedback from the steering committee. And so the steering committee was really instrumental in determining what the management objectives for this fishery are. Um, and then also to decide how we then translate that into these um, quantitative performance metrics that we can say, okay, there's an 80% probability of this happening. There's only a 10% probability of this happening if you use this, um, this particular harvest control rule. So, um, you know, and the way that this management strategy evaluation process works is that it allows us to both visualize the expected performance and also to look at the trade-offs involved. And so, you know, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, every fishery management strategy would be able to have both high catches and high stock sustainability, and there would be no trade-off between those two. But unfortunately, that's not how the world works. And so, you know, we've been trying to find this balance of a harvest control rule that will allow us to both, you know, ensure stock sustainability and avoid, um, you know, avoid spending too much time in a low stock state, um, while also ensuring that um, the fishery is economically viable and productive. So, um, so because of that, there's really no single best harvest control rule. It really comes down to what are your objectives and, you know, what are the trade-offs between, what trade-offs are you willing to accept um, between these different objectives? And so the steering committee weighed all of this information and then made a recommendation of a preferred management approach. And so that's what I'm going to show you guys today, their preferred approach for a harvest control rule. Um, and so just to describe the management objectives that um, the steering committee came up for for this herring fishery is to promote a healthy long-term average biomass and we say average long-term um, because the herring stock fluctuates wildly from year to year even even without any fishing it's just sort of you know the natural dynamics of this stock and so our um, our management approach recognizes that there is this inherent variability, but on average, we would like you know healthy, healthy stock levels. Um, we want to minimize the number of years that the stock is in a depressed state if it does dr drop below you know sort of a um, a threshold level. We want to maintain high long-term yield for the um, for the fishery, and we want to reduce the number of years with either a zero quota or a non-viable quota. And by that, I mean a quota that's so low that it's not worth it for anyone to go fishing because no buyers will come down to, you know, to actually buy herring. Um, and especially we want to reduce the number of consecutive closures because um, that's really hard on, on a fishery. And um, we wanted to maintain sort of overall stability in the quota. So these were sort of, you know, these were the, um, performance uh, measures that the steering committee was taking into account as they were making their decision for the preferred alternative. And you know, we learned some really interesting things that helped us, that basically helped the steering committee come to a decision about what a preferred alternative was from this type of analysis. So as I mentioned, due to variability in herring dynamics, the stock can, stock can dip below um, you know, desired levels even without any fishing, but we found that when we had a harvest control rule that had a cutoff, and so by a cutoff I mean an, a um, that basically if the st stock is below a certain um, size, there's no fishing in that year, and that um, harvest control rules that had that kind of a cutoff did a better job of allowing the stock to um, recover um, faster, and so um, it was decided that you know, this was a key thing that we wanted to incorporate in any, um, in any harvest control moving forward, because we really want to protect the ability of the stock to rebound from low sizes. Um, so again, I mentioned this need to balance these economic and ecological trade-offs. And so when we examined where was the best place to set this cutoff, um, you know, we found that there was a region where, because, because I mentioned that there's sort of a direct trade-off between these things, there was a region where as you increased, you know, the, the, where that cutoff was, if you basically said there's, you know, um, the stock needs to be an even larger size before fishing can start, there's a point where we stopped really getting any, any biological gains. There was no, 
um, increased ability of the of the stock to rebound, and we didn't really have a, you know a better long term average biomass, but we did start to have significant economic impacts, and so we wanted to really avoid that range. We wanted to make sure that any um, that you know we wanted to place a cutoff where we were getting sort of the most biological gains with the least economic impact. Um, and we found that, because we looked at a number of different harvest control rules, we found that those that ramped up harvest, and we were really looking at in this key range between five and 10%. So if you started out with lower harvest at lower stock sizes and ramped up your harvest rate as the stock grows, that that produced better long-term um, biological averages than you know, just sort of jumping up to 10% or even 8% going forward. Um, so the steering committee decided to incorporate that into our um, the preferred alternative as well. So, so that was, so that management strategy evaluation was the second of these key analyses underpinning our proposed plan. And so the third analysis is looking at ecosystem considerations and how do we incorporate these into uh, management decisions for herring. So as I mentioned before, herring are recognized forage fish within the California current ecosystem. And um, because of this, management must comply with the commission's policy on forage fish. And so that means it needs to include information on the impacts of fishing on predators. It needs to include information on alternative prey. Um, and so um, we did sort of an extensive analysis to try and get at these, these different issues, understand what information was available, and to see if there was any information that we could use in making management decisions. And, you know, this isn't entirely new for this fishery. Um, every year, the way that the, the uh, management decisions have been made, the um, Ryan and his team, they monitor the fishery during the season. They um, go back to the lab and, you know, count everything and they come up with their um, estimate and then they call a meeting with industry and they present all their data to um, to the fleet and they say this is what we're seeing this year you know these were you know this is the data that we collected and this is what it says and there, it's really a discussion because the members of the fleet then say okay yeah this is what we were seeing out on the water and and you know listening to the conversations that have come out of these meetings it really is a lot about um, environmental and ecosystem um, indicators but not in a formalized way in like an anecdotal way but I always say fishermen are, are really excellent at picking up on patterns. If they're not, then they're not going to be very good at their job. And so, um, you know, a lot of the fishermen really recognize, oh, okay, you know, we were seeing like the water was just really muddy and, you know, these were bad conditions this year for spawning. Or, you know, we were seeing a lot of anchovy and, you know, not many herring and, you know, our waters were really warm, things like that. And so all of that information has, was sort of, you know, informally taken into account as the department would then make a recommendation of what the quota should be this year. So we wanted to try to make that process more transparent and to provide a little bit more scientific guidance underpinning how that information should be used in, you know, when the department sets quotas each year. So um, to do that, we um, we use information from a very comprehensive database on observed diet compositions in um, the California current predators. And this database has every known published study um, on diet composition or trophic interactions. Um, and so it was a really good resource for us to have. Um, and so from that, the summary, summarized um, data from 83, um, 83 predator studies covering 58 species that are known to eat herring or herring roe. And so this was for the entire California current. Um, and then we really focused in to see what, what information was available for the San Francisco Bay area because, you know, we know, we, we really don't actually know where herring go um, when they leave the bay and, and go out into the ocean, but we're pretty sure they don't go out to British Columbia. And so we wanted to make sure that we were waiting you know, um, weighting trophic interactions that are appropriate to this area and informative for this area. Um, we also looked at information on alternative forage availability and whether or not there was some um, data that we could incorporate in a more formalized way. Um, and so, um, luckily, the um, NOAA has sort of a larger um, ongoing process to um, to create sort of an ecosystem. In, 
an integrated ecosystem approach for the California current. And so they have been tracking um, the, um, basically the stock fluctuations in um, a number of different alternative forage within the California current. And so these include things like um, uh, sardines and anchovies, but they also include things like jellyfish and um, uh, young rockfish also tend to be an important um, prey uh, item for predators. And so we can, it just gives us sort of a way to look at the, not just sort of, you know, what's the stock size for herring each year and how does that impact predators, but to look at the system in a more holistic way and say, what are the conditions generally for predators? And then um, uh, we also reviewed the literature on sort of, you know, management recommendations for forage fish generally. And so, you know, from all of this analysis, um, there were some key recommendations for how to incorporate ecosystem considerations into management of herring. Um, so there was, you know, when I said we had um, 83 different um, studies from, you know, the entire California current, but when we really focused in on the San Francisco Bay area, um, there was a lot, the data was a lot more limited. And in part, that's because we're at the very southern range of, of Pacific herring. Um, you know, the bulk of the stock is up near British Columbia and southern Alaska. And so up there you see herring um, plays a much larger role in um, predator um, diets. Additionally, you know, we know that, um, that uh, birds and marine mammals eat herring. We see them, you know, in the bay when the fishermen are fishing. Actually, I think it makes it life a little hard for the fishermen competing with the seals and sea lions. So we know that there are lots of things that, um, that eat herring. And, but there's fairly limited, um, a limited number of studies that are done in the winter months. Most scientific sampling is done in the summer because of weather, you know, that's, you're gonna go out on a boat, you probably wanna do it then. Um, and so, you know, from the few studies that we do have from, um, that looks at winter diet from herring, it does suggest that herring may provide um, sort of a strong seasonal forage option for um, some specific predators in this area. And those include Chinook, Chinook salmon, harbor seals, humpback whales, um, birds, so common muir and rhinoceros auklet, and then fish, um, predatory fish, such as Pacific hake. And so, um, part of what the FMP will do is make, make recommendations on future research needs. And so, you know, um, and then try to um, provide a, a um, mechanism going forward for how that information, you know, for future evolutions in our scientific understanding of predators' needs of herring can be incorporated into management. Um, so, you know, additionally, predators tend to use prey switching behavior, and that really allows them to buffer the impacts of, you know, um, say, for example, if there's not that many herring, they might switch to something else, you know, or if there's not that many something else, they might switch to herring, even though that's, you know, sardines are tastier or something. So, um, this ability to switch obviously is a good life strategy if you're a predator, but it makes it hard for us to understand, okay, so like, what is this relationship between, you know, how many herring do we need to leave for, for these predators? And, um, you know, what are the indicators in um, that predators might be um, suffering from lack of food? Um, for example, um, you know, in, in fisheries, we tend to just use stock size as a, a good indicator of stock health. For predators, it's a little bit more difficult because you might not see, um, you know, starvation events or die off until things are really severe, um, sort of across the board. Um, but so we've, um, you know, we're trying to look at what, um, what predator populations can we look at within the San Francisco Bay, and then what are good um, population metrics, you know, things like um, unusual mortality events or, um, or productivity rather than just population size to try and um, understand, you know, how, how basically predators needs and how herring management decisions affect that. 
Um, and then one of the things that come out of this analysis was, um, so in addition to incorporating these, you know, indices on alternative prey and then, you know, this predator health metrics um, into her the, the herring quota decision, um, there was a rec recommendation for a cutoff at, at um, lower stock sizes in order to provide a forage base for, um, for herring. And so we were already planning on having a cutoff for, um, to protect herring, but, you know, we, basically thought, okay, maybe we need to consider a slightly higher cutoff in order to make sure that um, we're accounting for predator needs. So, um, okay, so that was a lot of information, but I just wanted to give everyone an overview of, you know, the kinds of information that we've been looking at in creating this management strategy. Um, so remember, as I, I already went over this, you know, what, when I say management strategy, we are looking at, um, you know, data collection protocol, some method of analyzing that data, and some method of setting a quota each year. Um, so that's, that's our goal. And um, so as I said, the data collection protocol is set. Um, it's very robust and it will stay the same um, for San Francisco Bay because we have these, you know, consistent protocols since, you know, pretty much about 1980 um, that have been resulted in these valuable long-term data sets. And so we're not proposing any changes to that. Um, you know, and just to give an overview, the biologists currently collect, you know, in addition to this egg dep deposition and the number of recruits data that I mentioned earlier, they collect information on the age, length, weight composition um, of the stock, the number of spawns, um, what percentage of, you know, the herring are, um, are mature, um, through both monitoring the catch and then also doing a separate research fishery. So um, it's a pretty intensive process. Okay, so for the data analysis portion that we are recommending, um, so we are recommending that, you know, assuming that this predictive model um, goes, you know, successfully goes through peer review, then um, we're recommending that this predictive model is a really good opportunity for the stock to make more proactive decisions, for the, the staff um, to make uh, more proactive decisions when setting quotas, but um, the FMP will also describe, you know, the, the previous method as a, um, um, you know, as an alternative that can also be used um, as a potential tool for estimating spawning stock biomass. And then, you know, we have this, okay, how do we set catch limits each year? How do we set quotas? So, um, so I'm going to describe to you our preferred alternative for a harvest control rule. And as I said, it's this predetermined formula for setting quotas, and um, it meets the MLMA's um, requirement for adaptive management. Um, and so, you know, again, this, you know, in, in setting this, uh, in creating this preferred alternative, you know, we were really looking at, okay, how can we keep the recent precautionary management? How can we incorporate all of the information that we've just learned from these different analyses? And how do we balance, you know, these sort of conflicting goals of, um, you know, stock sustainability and an economically viable fishery? So I'm gonna walk through sort of step-by-step step the different pieces of this harvest control rule. Um, so this graph shows um, the estimated spawning stock biomass. So this would be whatever came out of that analysis method. You know, Ryan, they run this analysis, they get an estimate. And um, so this is, you know, potential stock sizes from zero to, fi to 50,000 tons. And then we set a quota based on that. Um, and so the quotas are on the um, Y axis. And so, um, so I'm going to sort of put a line in here that shows you what happens at each stage of the process. So um, first, I mentioned a cutoff. So we are proposing that as long as the stock, the estimated spawning stock biomass is below 15,000 15, tons, um, that there be no harvest. Um, but when the um, stock is above between 15,000 tons and 20,000 tons, we are recommending a quota of 750 tons for the fishery. And so this, this actually was a compromise between having, you know, a high enough cutoff that we were protecting predators' needs, but also having, you know, as I mentioned, some of our economic goals for this fishery are, you know, minimizing the years with a, a zero um, quota in order to 
keep the basically allow the fishermen to retain market access um, and to maintain a viable fleet. So um, what we thought is a fixed quota of 750 tons during you know this 15,000 to 20,000 um, region. You know, it's a fairly low quota for the fishermen, but um, from conversations we've had with fleet representatives, we think it's um, enough to keep the fishery going during, you know, these time periods. And so then once the stock um, is above 20,000, the, um, so remember I mentioned harvest rates. So we're looking at harvest rates between five and 10%. The harvest rates at 20,000 jumps up to 5%. So 5% um, of 20,000 is a quota of 1,000 tons. And then it ramps up um, as the stock grows from 20,000 to 30,000, the harvest rate ramps up to 10%. And so, or 10% of 30,000 is a harvest, um, is a quota of 3,000 tons. So, and then from there, um, we're proposing a cap on the quota of 3,000 tons moving forward. Um, so even though, you know, even with the, um, uh, as the stock is, you know, larger than 30,000 tons, and we've seen, seen stock sizes that, you know, historical um, stock sizes that can range, you know, up to more than 100,000 tons um, in some years. Um, but we're proposing that the um, quota stay the same. And the reason for that is that in consultation with um, industry representatives, the fleet actually has sort of a limited ability to catch more fish than this. Um, so, you know, and we've looked at historical records and looked at, okay, you know, when there were X participants in the fleet, you know, how many, how much fish could they catch? And so, um, we basically decided that this seemed like a reasonable amount that um, it actually wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be terribly limiting to um, to the fleet because it would be difficult for them to catch more than this anyways. So this is this is the um, control rule for a preliminary quota. So what you would do is the department, you know, Ryan and his team, they would analyze their data, they would get some estimate of what their current stock um, biomass is. Um, and they would say, okay, you know, whatever it is, basically draw a line up and that's your quota. And then, you know, I mentioned that we want to incorporate ecosystem considerations. And um, because we know that, you know, productivity and pairing is dependent on both, you know, environmental conditions um, and those environmental conditions that basically, you know, impact how much forage is available for predators. Um, and so our proposed mechanism for incorporating the available information on, um, on uh, these different you know, alternative prey and predators is to create a, um, what we call a decision matrix. And it's basically a table that says, this is the information you know, for, for alternative prey. This is what you should collect. This is how it should be interpreted. This is where the data comes from. Um, and it provides some, it's, it's not, um, it is not quantitative, it's qualitative. So it doesn't say, oh, if, you know, if the status of sardines is, you know, this number, then this is a decision that needs to be made. Because unfortunately, this um, ecosystem-based management is an evolving, a new and evolving science. So we are trying to incorporate what information is available, but without being too prescriptive and to, you know, give the department some flexibility um, to incorporate that information into their decision and make the best possible decision. So what we, um, um, so basically what we're asking um, the biologists to do is to include for all of these different indicators included in this table, um, they would say, okay, so the table tells me to look at the status of sardines as an alternative prey for herring. What's the current status of sardines? How has it been trending in the last few years? Um, and to just describe, you know, describe what it currently is, and then to document for each of these different indicators um, what the current status is, and then to make sort of adjustments to the preliminary quota. So the preliminary quota that comes from this harvest control rule um, to adjust it, and I'll show you how that works. But um, so just some, um, for this decision matrix, you know, some of the indicators that we are looking at, um, you know, we're looking at um, 
an indicator for herring prey because you know herring everything eats herring but herring you have to eat too they eat krill um, and and other small sort of um, zooplankton and so we say okay you know we go to this National Marine Fishery Science um, report on forage that's updated every year and we say what is the status of krill they classify it as red green or yellow the department lists that information describes what it is um, and then moves on to the next one you know um, so I mentioned sardines and anchovies and they'll look at the status of those um, other invertebrates such as squid um, these juvenile um, ground fish um, you know, so hake and rockfish essentially, what are the status of those? And then we're also looking at, you know, has there been an unusual mortality event in key predators? And so we're currently suggesting um, that um, the, the um, NOAA tracks unusual mortality events for San Francisco Bay harbor seals. So we're suggesting that they use that information. Um, and then, you know, this basically we want to create a, um, a system where the department can then add additional indicators to this as, as more information becomes available. But so when incorporating this, you know, these kinds of ecosystem indicators into our harvest control rule framework, so what this means is that the department has a little flexibility to say, okay, the you know, preliminary recommended quota based on just the stock size of herring um, is, you know, is say, 20,000 tons, but ecosystem conditions are generally good. And we know that herring can actually handle slightly higher harvest rates than, you know, so basically if it was, say the stock size was 20,000, um, no, or, you know, 25,000. And um, so that gives us a, you know, an approximately 7.5% harvest rate. But we know that herring, you know, that even a 10% harvest rate of herring is precautionary. So if ecosystem conditions are good, according to all of these different indicators, then that gives the department some latitude to then increase the quota within these predefined bounds. Um, and so additionally, if ecosystem indicators suggest that, you know, conditions aren't very good or there might be a problem, the department has some flexibility to, again, adjust the quota lower in order to account for that. And then we have a couple of situations where if there are extreme, extreme um, events that occur. So the first one is, you know, we really didn't want to put too much flexibility around this 750 quota between um, 15,000 and 20,000 because you know that quota was put in place to almost to provide a guarantee for the fishermen that there will be you know there will be some fishery for them um, however if there is you know a really severe mortality event or um, you know an oil spill or something like that the department does um, retain the ability to close the fishery you know in case of you know something severe and then additionally, if even though the herring, you know, stock size um, seems fine, um, if again, if ecological conditions are really severe, then the department does have the latitude to um, reduce quotas um, under those conditions. And so, um, so this basically this framework, it. It provides what we've been calling bounded flexibility. You know, it it provides this transparency. You know, so that um, any outsider or you know a permit holder can you know have some idea of how the department is making decisions each year um, when setting quotas. But it also provides the department with you know a bit of flexibility to use. Um, to use current up-to-date information because an FMP we can't one of the issues with writing an FMP is that if we're overly prescriptive a condition might come up that we hadn't actually planned for within the FMP so we want the department to be able to adapt to evolving conditions and um, you know to um, enable their scientists to make you know decisions based on those conditions moving forward so as I described, you know, I, I said we're crafting a holistic management strategy and a management strategy is data collection, you know, for assuming we use this predictive model to, um, to estimate spawning stock biomass, you know, it requires these three pieces of data. 
um, data analysis procedure. So I've described what you know, our preferred method is for that. And then this harvest control role to set quota. And so our, our preferred method is you know, plugging biomass into this harvest control role, getting a preliminary quota, looking at these environmental and ecosystem indicators, um, and then adjusting the quota based on that, and then setting a final quota for the year. That's our proposed procedure. And we think that this harvest control framework has a lot of benefits. Um, so this predictive model that I mentioned, you know, it incorporates these, um, you know, environmental and biological um, uh, indicators for herring, you know, and ideally that, that will help improve the accuracy of the harvest rate, um, but it also helps the department to account for climate change um, by having this sea surface temperature um, indicator within the predictive model. And, you know, one of the major goals for California fisheries moving forward is to be what they call climate ready. Um, this 15,000 ton cutoff that we're proposing, um, it's a precautionary limit and that protects, you know, the herring stock, both the ability of the herring stock to recover on its own when, um, when you know, the stock dips below um, this 15,000 level, but it also provides some protection for forage um, when the stock is low. You know, the 750 ton quota, you know, in this zone between 15,000 and 20,000 tons um, is minimizing the number of closure years, you know, and trying to provide a stable quota that fishermen can count on. Um, and then this 5 to 10% harvest rates, you know, that codifies this precautionary management moving forward. And then incorporating these forage indicators, it allows us to include ecosystem considerations. So this harvest control rule meets a lot of our sort of goals um, moving forward. And, you know, it's precautionary, it's adaptive, it's based on the best available science, it's data driven, it's transparent. It's easy to apply with existing data streams, which is really important um, in creating a, manage a fishery management plan. We can't really require the department to collect more data, new data, without, you know, without any, if they don't have additional funding to do that. Um, and it balances these economic and ecosystem goals. And so, as I said, this fishery is primarily managed through a quota, but we have other management restrictions in place that help to provide additional protections um, for the herring stock. And so, um, you know, there's a mesh limit, a size limit on the um, gear that can be used that basically um, selects for uh, mature fish. And this allows, you know, based on um, analyses that have been done on the selectivity of the gear currently used, we think that this mesh size allows all fish to produce at least one year before they become vulnerable to the gear. Um, the, uh, we have a restriction on the season. The fishing season doesn't start until January, but herring you know, may, might start coming into the Bay to Spawn as early as November. And so, um, you know, this, and, and also it's been documented that the largest herring come in early in the season. And so that allows sort of the biggest, um, the biggest spawners to spawn in an uninterrupted manner earlier in the season. Um, we have this temporal restriction on weekend fishing. So that means that the um, fleet in San Francisco Bay, they can fish during the week, but they, have, they cannot fish from um, noon on Friday to 5 p.m. on Saturday. And so that allows, you know, spawn, spawns that occur to um, potentially get a break if they're being fished. Um, and, and then we have these spatial restrictions within the bay and um, those protect um, prime spawning habitat. So, um, so all in all, we think that this is actually just a, a very comprehensive and precautionary management approach. So the management approach that I just described with these elements is really data rich. And so it's not appropriate to the areas outside of San Francisco Bay. So I'm now gonna transition away from San Francisco Bay and talk about what our proposed approach is for these other areas. Um, so currently, you know, while there historically were productive fisheries in Tamales and um, Humboldt and Crescent City, um, those haven't been fished since around the mid 2000s. There's been no, no one who's fished commercially in, in those areas. And that it's actually due um, primarily to economic issues. Um, certainly up in Humboldt Bay, they, have, um, they lost access to um, 
to a processor to basically to some way to you know store the fish um, and so that has actually um, been the primary reason that there's been no fishing in these other bays um, but we want to make sure that should should some of these market and economic conditions change that um, there is a path for um, access to sustainably managed fisheries in these areas and so I refer to them as unassessed areas because we don't have the same kind of comprehensive monitoring programs um, in these areas that we do in San Francisco Bay. Previously, there was comprehensive monitoring in Tamales, and then it was sort of, there's been some surveys sporadically in Humboldt, and then Crescent City has never had any surveys. And so, you know, but it's, even the ones in Tamales haven't occurred for over 10 years. And so given the life cycle of herring, that means that those fish haven't been fished commercially. You know, the fish that live now have never been impacted by a commercial fishery. So we have reason to believe that the fish, that the stock has returned to an unfished state. And so what, we, what our goal is for these other areas is to maintain a, a conservative quota in these areas because we want to provide access to fishermen should they want to fish, should things change, um, but then to develop a monitoring system that relies on collaboration between fishermen and the department um, to monitor fishing when it occurs, to, um, to be able to detect the impact of fishing on the stock and to adjust quotas as necessary. And so, uh, and we want this to be consistent with the department's goal of precautionary management. Um, you know, and these areas have fairly limited staffing resources from the department. And so we needed to come up with a less labor intensive um, monitoring procedure. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons we're relying really heavily on collaboration with fishermen. But additionally, we also don't want a co collaborative data collection to be a burden on fishermen. We know they're there to fish. Um, you know, we want them to be able to assist the department in ways that don't interrupt fishing operations, et cetera. So um, this, so what I'm describing is currently still under development, but um, you know, we have basically an idea of, of what we want to do moving forward for these areas. So as I mentioned, it starts with these conservative quotas um, that remain in effect in these areas. Should some, and so while no one is fishing, under this fishery management plan, the department would not be required to do any fishery monitoring as long as there's no fishing going on. But as soon as someone starts fishing, the department is then um, required to do, you know, to institute this collaborative research protocol. And so the collaborative portion includes, um, so we're proposing logbooks to provide some information on fishing effort that fishermen can report. Um, themselves. Um, some sampling, uh, one of the easiest kinds of um, data to collect in these, you know, what we term data poor fisheries is length and weight um, information from the commercial catch. And that can be informative in just helping the department to um, detect whether or not fishing is creating um, a, a, a change in the length composition of the stock or in the weight composition of the stock. And so a lot of this, um, this proposed management strategy is just trying to set up a, pr a protocol where w the department can detect negative changes if they're happening and then respond accordingly. Um, and then um, asking fishermen to assist in documenting spawns. And so one of the hardest things it, for the biologist is to just know when spawns are happening because it's really hard to, you know, patrol an entire bay. And, um, and so um, just having fishermen report when, you know, basically when they see herring spawning in an area, you know, when they, when they think it started and the location of it is actually hugely helpful to department staff um, because they can then get out there and, and try and survey that spawn. Um, and so additionally, San Francisco Bay has had a collaborative research um, uh, protocol in place where fishermen actually you know, drive around the bay and look for spawns and then collect some additional data um, 
documenting the location of the spawns and, and things. And so um, we've been working off of that to try and say, okay, so should fishermen be interested in further assisting the department with documenting spawns? You know, can we create a protocol that they can follow that provides some usable information for the department? And so, you know, our idea, again, this actually counting eggs in the way that Ryan and his team does is incredibly um, time consuming and labor intensive. And so we are trying to develop a semi-quantitative method to estimate the relative size of spawns in these other areas when they occur. Um, and so the idea is that um, you, so the department goes out, you know, they, they get a report of a spawn, they go out and they record the approximate size of the spawn, so the approximate area that's covered, and then um, the um, approximate density of the spawn. And then they do that for each of the spawns throughout the season. And they, you know, through the scoring system that we're developing, they basically will classify the spawning biomass for the year as high, medium, or low. And then, you know, I said we'll have sort of a conservative low quota in place for the, you know, that's um, for the fishery when there's no data available. But if there's, you know, data is collected and um, the spawning biomass is estimated to be high, um, it's possible that the quota could then be increased. And so what we would have is, you know, sort of a higher increase in quota when um, a spawn, you know, when there's sort of a high spawning year, you know, a medium quota when there's a medium spawning year, and then this sort of going back to this low conservative um, quota when the stock size is low. And so what this does is it gives the department sort of a data poor method of adjusting spawns in relate, you know, sorry, adjusting quotas in relation to new data that's coming in. Um, and what we're hoping is that it provides an incentive for fishermen participation in this collaborative research protocol, because the more spawns that the department gets out there and counts, the more likely you are to, to have had a you know, high here. So, um, so this is what we're proposing for these other areas. And you know, we, this proposal really fits into this sort of larger um, management strategy within that, you know, that we're pursuing. Um, and so, the way that we think about these unassessed areas fitting into this larger data collection protocol is that, you know, what I described is sort of when, the, when an area is in tier one, like I said, no data collection is required because there's not really active fishing going on, but there are precautionary quotas in place. Um, once fishing starts, the, the um, area moves into tier two, and that's when this collaborative um, monitoring uh, process kicks in. And, you know, again, so the quota is based on this sort of categorical um, stock status. And then should, because you know what, things change, should um, economic or ecological conditions change such that there is suddenly much stronger demand, you know, for, um, fishing in Tamales Bay or up in Humboldt or Crescent City, the, this proposed protocol provides an avenue to transition into, you know, for the department to say, okay, we actually need to put more resources um, into monitoring these other areas. And so to actually institute the current, the monitoring program that's in San Francisco Bay in these other areas, and then to um, move towards a harvest control rule that looks more like San Francisco Bay. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're basically, when we are crafting this FMP, we have to create a plan that works not only for current conditions, but also for possible future conditions. And so, you know, it is possible that even though we've had, you know, pretty low demand for fishing in the last 10 to 15 years in these other areas, um, it could increase. And so we think that this plan kind of provides a mechanism for how the department can, um, can manage those fisheries moving forward. Hey Sarah, I thought, quick time check, so it's uh, 1.23. Okay. And I thought maybe we would check in with the public on what you've presented so far okay. before we go through the, the proposed regulatory changes. That sounds good. And so I just wanted to hear if you guys had any um, questions or comments on what you guys have seen so far um, that Sarah's presented. So 
And actually, if you wouldn't mind, could you come up here just so that the computer can pick up the comments because the, the meeting is being recorded in case, or, or you can just be really loud. Um, <laughs> the meeting is being uh, recorded. We have a few people participating via webinar, and then additionally, we'll be putting this up later in case there are interested people. Yeah. yeah. Well, my name is Skylar Olson. I work at the Conservation and Development Commission. I just had a quick question if you could just comment on the, the size of the fleet and the, and the bay, how, how the quarter would be divided amongst the three mm -hmm. transfer boards. So I'm going to get into that a little bit in the next section, um, but just to touch on it. So the, um, the current fleet size is 150. Six permit holders in San Francisco Bay. There's about 150. Yeah. Okay, around 150 yeah. permit holders in San Francisco Bay. But holding a permit entitles you to fish one net every other week. So each so permit holders will assign their permits to a boat, um, and that boat can then fish two gill nets, and that's sort of the most that a boat can fish. Um, and so. Um, when we actually think about the capacity of a boat, we're thinking if it's two nets during every week, fish during every week of the season, that's four permits that need to be assigned to that boat. And so then we looked at, okay, so, you know, say there's 150 to 160 permit holders in San Francisco Bay, that's approximately 40 boats if everyone was fishing. And so then we talked through, okay, so what, you know, how much can a boat catch? How much do boats catch on average? And, um, and so we thought that with, um, that boats could on average catch around 100 tons during the season. So, um, so basically 40 boats catching 100 tons during the season, that's 4,000 tons for a quota. Um, one of the uh, so I'll talk about this a little bit coming up, but one of the proposed regulatory changes, and this was a suggestion by our industry representatives on the steering committee, um, is to have a long-term capacity reduction goal to 30 boats um, for the season. And so, um, so basically, if that's where the 3,000 ton cap came from, um, is you know, 30 boats catching approximately on average, 100 tons for the season. But just to clarify, the, yeah. it's a single quota. Yeah, single quota. It's not an individual. They're not individual transferable. This is not a transferable quota. It, say the quota is 1,000 tons, those 40 boats. Everybody has an equal shot at catching that amount. That one guy can catch all 1,000 tons. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I just want to make sure we stay on time. So I do want to make sure we have a, plenty of room for time for comments. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can go to the next. Yeah, unless there's any other burning questions. I just have one, one quick question. Um, my name is John Miller. I'm a commercial fisherman from San Francisco. And I was wondering, is there any overlap between the stocks that have spawned in Tomales and San Francisco Bay since it's such a you know, relatively close distance? I'm sure that they must intermix in the ocean or something like that. And I'm just wondering, first of all, do we know that they you know, are loyal to one or the other, or do they go back and forth? And second of all, does this figure into your model in terms of uh, ecosystem productivity? <coughs> it's a good question. Um, so we have very limited information on that, but there was a study conducted in the early 90s that um, used, it's really interesting actually, they used parasites as a way to tag fish. They basically said, okay, the, these fish in San Francisco Bay have a unique parasite signature um, from the fish in Tamales Bay. And so what they thought was that the fish from San Francisco Bay in the summer are actually going down to 
Monterey, Monterey area, but it seemed like the tamales fish are different. They have different parasites and they don't know where they go. So that's, we don't have, it's not great information, but it's the best that we have. And so we made the assumption that San Francisco Bay is a single stock when we modeled it. We didn't take into account tamales. Oh, but they can't use like DNA or something? You know, I, I, my understanding is, I mean, there have been in other areas, so up in Washington, they have used DNA and they have found um, very distinct spatial signatures within Puget Sound that indicate sort of se separate stocks. I don't know that anything that comprehensive has been done on San Francisco Bay, um, but my understanding is that what little DNA information we do have doesn't provide strong suggestions for, um, you know, for there being separate stocks, actually. So... So basically, nothing that happens in Tomales Bay enters into the predictive model of the sample. Exactly. And that's just an assumption that we have made going forward. And, you know, a large part of this FMP is marking areas where future information is needed. So we'll take one more before we go into the yeah. uh, The harvest amounts for. I'm sorry, can you say you well, Dan, you open uh, the same one. The harvest amounts for Eureka Crescent Signal Tamales, Eureka Crescent City. Um, so we have been, we have had some conversations with um, scientists up in Humboldt Bay and then also fishermen up there um, to discuss, to get feedback on a, you know, what they would consider a viable quota. Because again, we've done this similar economic um, analysis that we did down in San Francisco is okay what like how much would you need to catch to even like get a buyer here to you know make to make this worthwhile um, so we have been talking to people in um, the humble area we we still need to work on trying to find some people to talk to about tamales um, but so we don't have any hard numbers to propose yet because we're still sort of figuring that out. But we really are taking into account, you know, again, balancing this wanting to be conservative for the stock, but also recognizing that, you know, the current quotas that are in place were in place for a long time. And the fishery, you know, they, they, those quotas were caught year after year. The fishery seemed to be sustainable. And so, um, you know, and we want to make sure that if someone wanted to go fishing, that they could actually, you know, make some money doing that. So. So is there a chance we, we will be looking at all those. I mean, just based on the, there's a difference. There's a difference between the amount of available data in those areas. So just pragmatically, we have to look at them differently. It's, we're still considering that. Mm -hmm. Nothing's been proposed, so we're we're still just in the kind of exploratory phase at this point. Yeah, I will say that we have a lot more data on tamales than we do on the um, the two northern fisheries. So it's likely that they might be more conservative than tamales. I'm sorry, let's go on to the regulatory changes. And maybe if we can try to set a goal, get through those. And, uh... Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure we have plenty of time for comments. We go till three. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, FMP gives us this opportunity to update the regulations. Um, and so I'm gonna talk through the, you know, sort of what the process is for um, changing those regulations for each of these different sectors. So we have commercial gillnet fleets. So I think we have 172 permit holders total, but that accounts for the other bays, you know, where there are permit holders still, um, you know, people who still hold permits even if they haven't been fishing them. Um, and then the um, commercial herring eggs on kelp fishery. So there's 10 permit holders. Um, and just to describe, so the gillnet fleet uses gillnets to catch fish. The um, herring eggs on kelp uh, dangles kelp off these rafts and lines and um, tries to get the herring to lay eggs on the kelp. And then those blades of kelp are then harvested. And so, you know, they have the row on them. And so those are, um, that's how it's sold. And um, again, primarily to the Japanese markets. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting fishery in that it's, it doesn't result in the deaths of any adult herring. So um, any herring that uh, 
you know, spawn on the kelp, then get to leave the bay and, you know, live to spawn another day. So um, it's thought to be, you know, potentially a more sustainable fishery. Um, and then we have the recreational fishery. And we really have very limited data on the recreational fishery, but I'll talk through that a little bit more when we get to it. Um, so for the regulatory development process, we had, so we had a general scoping process when we kicked off this FMP. Um, and we, you know, there was an opportunity to, for people to comment then on it, um, on, on our intended scope of these are the issues that this FMP is going to look at. Um, and so then that, that information was taken into account, all those comments were recorded, the stakeholder, um, sorry, the steering committee discussed them and sort of, you know, defined the scope of the FMP based on that. Then we had permit holder surveys. So we sent out permits to, um, all permit holders and ask them a bunch of questions um, related to their preferences for regulatory changes and um, you know we use that to craft a proposal for regulatory changes um, for the gillnet fleet um, and um, and then we've been getting uh, information from sort of the relevant entities within the department. And so this is enforcement and um, license and revenue and the higher up management to figure out, okay, so, you know, um, cause they all have wants and desires about how the regulations should be changed as well. Um, so, you know, we're trying to find an avenue that makes as many people happy as possible. And so then we have this draft of the proposed regulatory changes and, um, we presented that to um, the Gillnet fleet to represent, you know, to basically anyone who was interested in attending from the Gillnet fleet at a meeting two weeks ago. And so we got comments from them, recorded those comments. We'll be discussing with the steering committee. Um, and so again, you know, we'll be taking all of your comments today um, back to the steering committee. And so um, it's an iterative process. But so um, for the Gillnet fleet, um, which is sort of the largest sector, the proposed regulatory changes, there's sort of seven key changes. Um, so one is to eliminate the platoon system. And so the way that the Gillnet fleet fishes is they um, are assigned, their permits are assigned to either an even platoon or an odd platoon. And so, you know, the even ones fish every other week and the odd ones fish in the intervening weeks. And this is a remnant of when, when there were 450 permit holders and we had, there was sort of a, a major um, spatial conflict within San Francisco Bay because San Francisco Bay obviously has, you know, a lot going on. There's a lot of different um, sort of human uses going on. And um, so this, this every other week system was devised to try to, to um, limit interactions between herring vessels and nets and, you know, sort of other activities in the bay. Um, but given that the number of permit holders has reduced considerably, um, there really isn't any reason to have this platoon system anymore. So one of the major goals of this FMP, you know, we heard pretty strong desire from the fleet that they wanted to eliminate the platoon system and from the department because it's additional, you know, sort of management work that they need to do um, to, regulate, to regulate the platoons. So, um, so that was one of the, the, you know, one of the goals and then we wanted to create a new permitting system with that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we wanted to develop a mechanism for permit consolidation. Um, so as I said, instead of having, you know, a permit be assigned to a net, we eventually want to get to a system where a permit is, um, is basically entitles a person to fish two nets on a boat. Um, because mechanistically that makes more sense in this fishery. Um, and then to establish this long-term capacity goal that I referenced earlier um, under this new system. And so additionally, we, um, so actually, you know, I'm going to just go ahead and talk about those three a little bit more before I move on to the rest of these. So as I mentioned, the platoon system was much larger. One permit was one net. And um, essentially the way it works out is that in order for a boat to fish during every week of the season, it needs four permits assigned to it, two in the even platoon, two in the odd platoon. The problem is that an individual can only own three permits. So they are always needing to have someone else assign a per permit to their vessel. Um, 
And so this does, requires a lot of paperwork to track which vessels, you know, which permits are assigned to which vessels. Um, and it's through this process called substitution. And so, um, as I mentioned, this is added regulatory complication. And so we are proposing a system that we have worked out the details, we presented the details to the fleets. Um, I'm not gonna go through it now because of time constraints, but the goals of the system are to allow permit holders to fish every week of the season um, while keeping the same number of nets in the water, because that's really important. We don't want to create a system where suddenly we're doubling the amount of gear in the water. Um, so we wanna keep gear levels the same while allowing people to fish every week. Um, and then create a system where, you know, instead of having this, this like, um, system where people can only own three permits, we want to allow people to own four permits. So then a fisherman can say, okay, I can get an, a fourth permit. I now have four. I can fish two nets on my boat every week because that's sort of the most you can fish. And then I can convert that permit to, um, well, we're having a tiered permit system, so a tier two permit. Um, and that's, the goal is basically to get everyone in the long term converted to tier two permits. And so the department has decided that a long-term capacity goal that is sustainable for the stock is 40 boats um, fishing two nets every week. But we are considering this, um, this proposal of, of 30 as a capacity goal um, that came from industry. So, and then if you, basically changing to this um, new permitting system, uh, it basically allows us to streamline a few other regulations. Currently, so currently um, because of this system where, you know, a permit holder, you know, might just have one permit and assign their net to a boat, uh, it's been necessary to track which permit numbers were associated with which nets on the water. And now with this new system, we won't need to do that anymore. And so we can just identify nets based on which vessel they belong to. Um, and so that just makes the regulations a little bit easier. Um, and enforcement will still be able to track, you know, who's doing what, how many nets each boat has, um, et cetera. And then additionally, it gives us an opportunity to eliminate this substitution paperwork. Um, so we have a process proposed to allow fishermen to um, still assign their, their permit to a vessel, um, but without having to go through this sort of existing channel. Um, and then we have some proposed alterations to the permitting process, and these are actually came primarily from the License and Revenue Board. So um, it's basically, it's mostly motivated um, by a desire to bring the herring permitting process in line with the rest of California. So this means um, having the same date, the same um, uh, date for permitting renewal as we have in all other fisheries currently pairing's weird and it has its own date, but um, so we're proposing to bring that in line. Um, and um, some changes to the way that um, uh, permits are transferred and then sort of bringing the fee structure in line with how it's done for all other fisheries. And then this last one is that we're proposing to set uniform dates across all of the areas. And so um, Currently, every area has its own seasonal dates. And so what we are proposing is to institute the dates in San Francisco Bay um, for all of the areas. So this, the fishery would start January 1 and go to March 15th um, in all of the areas. The weekend closure in San Francisco Bay will still be in effect. And so what that means is if the fish, so if the first falls on a Saturday, then the, um, the fishery will just open on the, at five o'clock on the following Sunday. Um, the weekend closure doesn't exist in the other areas. So um, just a, a way for us to sort of streamline everything and make enforcement a little bit easier across the state. So um, we're additionally going through sort of a similar parallel process with the eggs on kelp sector. And so um, there's only been one person fishing, Stan, he's here. Um, and so we have been working with him um, to understand what changes he would like to see in the, um, in the fishery and, um, and then talking through, um, you know, 
those proposed changes with enforcement and license and revenue, and we're still in the process of drafting um, a proposal for that. But we're looking at changes that will, you know, try to restore parity in fees between gillnet and eggs on kelp sector, um, because just sort of due to historical vagaries, the um, eggs on kelp have paid a lot more in fees. Um, and so we wanna try and bring those in line with gillnets. Um, some changes to try and modernize the um, operational regulations and then you know, allow um, eggs on kelp fishermen to participate in collaborative research with the department to try and um, help them out. And so for the recreational sector, there have not been any regulations um, governing recreational take. So that means there's no take limit, there's no restrictions on gear, there's, um, there's nothing. And so we have really very little data on the recreational sector. It's long been thought that it was just a small percentage of the, um, the um, herring commercial catch. And so I think because of that perception, it's, you know, basically the department has sort of not had to deal with it but recent observations by um, fishing game staff and from you know some of the commercial fishermen suggest that the recreational um, fishery might be growing um, and there's worry about the illegal commercialization so basically people who are doing recreational fishing but are selling it um, and so our goals, you know, when we talked with the steering committee about what are the goals for, you know, developing some regulations for the recreational sector, they want to create regulations that still provide for a satisfying recreational experience while discouraging the commercialization. Um, and so to that end, the proposed regulatory changes are um, to set a daily bag limit of um, 50 pounds, and that's approximately two five gallon buckets. And um, so we think that that's a reasonable amount for personal consumption. Um, and to specifying the kinds of gear that are allowable. And so this would be, you know, lines and, and hand cast nets um, thrown from the shore. Um, and so what that does by specifying, you know, the allowable gear type, it means that um, it, it basically puts bounds and, and discourages commercialization because, you know, currently someone could potentially go get a gill net and, you know, use that to take herring recreationally. So, um, so that's a regulatory change we want to make. And then we're exploring potential um, temporal restrictions for future use that, and so these would be, we're not actually proposing that these be implemented now, but the department, because they have so little information on the recreational sector and because it does seem to be growing, if the bag limit doesn't seem to be providing enough protection to the stock, we want the department to have you know, some, some other tools um, and so some sort of temporal restriction and that could be um, time of day or you know, something like a weekend closure or a specific season for recreational, something like that that the department could, um, could institute. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so actually one of our, you know, primary goals is um, because of the nature of the recreational fishery, you know, permit holders, we have their address, we can mail them, you know, flyers and invite them to meetings and things, but we've had a hard time getting in touch with the recreational fishery. And so we're really interested in soliciting feedback on these proposed changes from recreational fishermen. Um, because again, you know, we, we are really trying to take into account stakeholder views as we make these changes. So, um, so next steps will be, um, you guys will have the opportunity to comment. You know, we're very interested in hearing your comments. Um, hopefully, if you've learned nothing else from this presentation, it's that we take everyone's input very seriously. Um, and um, we will definitely be going back to the steering committee and talking through the feedback that we get from this meeting. Um, and then additionally moving forward, you know, so we're in the stakeholder feedback um, portion. We're going to be presenting a proposed, this proposed management strategy to the Marine Resources Committee of the Commission um, in March. And then, you know, we'll be trying to go through a peer review process for the entire FMP um, sort of this summer and an, apart, an internal department review. And then we'll hopefully be presenting a final plan to the Commission in October. So that's all I got. Yeah, comments, yeah. Um, Chris Campbell, commercial fisherman, San Francisco. 
since 1982. Um, first thing, the time of the opening, I talked to Brian about this yeah. January 1st. Talking to the industry, it's hard for the fish buyers to get trucks. So if we catch fish on the first, it's a holiday. And the second, like we could be coming in at six in the morning, well, it's a holiday and they can't get trucks to get it. So it would be best if it was the second. And that five o'clock, not the noon thing, was, you know, we should stay with five o'clock. And if it was on a two, if it's on a Thursday, it would be the second, be it a Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If it's on a Thursday, there's no sense going fishing on Thursday night and ending at noon the next day. Just wait. I think the Thursday is the cutoff, the closing cutoff, and then it would be the box. Okay, so that's my one comment. The other comment I have is the recreational fishery. I think it should be one bucket. Because I mean, I'm, I'm just down there at the Hunter's Point there, or at the ramp the other day. And I, I think it should be five, it should be daybreak to sundown. Because people are out there all night. I don't know how much fish, I know how many herring I can eat. And I go to Chinatown, and I see herring for sale in Chinatown the next day. And so it, it should be one bucket of herring, and it should be daybreak to sundown, so that there can be some regulation of this thing. Because there's people, there was people on the whole beach, just ice chest, pickup trucks, whatever. And you know, once you put this into regulations, the other thing that's going to happen, I've seen it every fishery I've been involved. Once you put it in the regulations to stop the growth of it now, it's actually going to grow. Because then everybody's going to go, oh, I can take herring. Right now, not everybody knows that they can take herring. But once it goes in the regulation book, even though we think we're going to stop the amount, it's actually going to grow. I know it sounds weird, but that's how this happens. Because then someone who's not even involved in this is going to go, oh, I can catch, I can go with a five pound bucket of herring. I know it sounds different, but that's how these things go. So that's, those are my comments about it. Other comments? I think uh, does everybody understand the, uh, the permit changes and, and the tier one, tier two questions about that. Yeah, I went through that fast to try and give us time, but I'm happy to answer any questions or provide more detail. Yeah. You know, the idea of the consolidation, it's the, you know, as Sarah was saying, when currently there's uh, a permit on every net, fisherman has to have four permits on his boat to fish every week, and currently the signage, you need to sign for each permit on your boat. And so the idea is to consolidate that, try to make it easier both for the department and also easier for industry to where if they do get to all tier two permits, one sign, you know, and two nets and fish every week. So the idea is to simplify without growing the fishery. And then the control rule, um, that was also kind of how they're going to get to what that harvest amount is. Um, sort of, I think the, the steering committee's goal there was sort of to mimic what the department's doing currently, but to actually put it in a, in a format that is a little more structured so maybe people know what to expect a little sooner based off of that structure. So that was what the goal was there. But the, the comments about uh, recreational fishery and also the start dates is very helpful and definitely will be included in future discussions. But any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm, my name is Alistair Bland. I'm a recreational fisherman. I, I just want to say I think one bucket is too restrictive because, as you know, as any herring fisherman knows, commercial or recreational, when you you can't fish for herring anytime you want because you have to wait till they come in. And uh, I agree that garbage cans and maybe even large coolers and pickup trucks are way overkill, way excessive, and that needs to be restricted. But if that's the problem, one bucket is, is too restrictive. That, that's not, that's over solving the problem. And I think um, certainly two buckets, one per hand, makes, makes sense. And, and, and also, I want to say that one bucket, it's not that many herring. If you, if you have a family, you eat it with, you put it in the freezer, and you eat it through the year, it's not very much. And 
because of the way the herring come in and they're not they're not available anytime you want them. That might wind up being your your whole year's too. And, and that should be taken into consideration. I, I think there needs to be a bag limit, but um, not yeah, sure. At least two you're gonna have two buckets. You're gonna have you're gonna have two buckets, and then you're gonna have mother, father, grandfather, child, everybody. I'm telling you, it's gonna grow. All right. Well, I see commercial boats filling their boats with herring, and then and then they don't even get eaten except yeah. for the row, and they they get. As far as I understand, they mostly get um, fed to you know the livestock. So. You could argue about what's what's a, a useful, efficient use of the resource. People taking it home and feeding their families, or sending it to Canada and the road to Japan. Who knows what the rest of the fish? Yeah, well, we we'll appreciate that, and we'll we'll take in both uh, comments. And it's good to hear from a recreational fisherman. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Mike Chin. I'm a recreational fisherman as well. So I. I support something like two buckets that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, I, I think I heard Sarah say something about temporal closures for weekends. So I think I'm okay with a closure at night, for instance, in general. Most of the runs last throughout the day, but, but a, a specific day, a whole day closure could mean that there's no access, because some of these runs in short only last a day or two, especially on a weekend. I mean, um, you know, uh, so, so I would urge not a temporal closure that includes like a whole day, and especially um, leave access for people on the weekends, mm -hmm. uh, primarily because also that uh, there's more fish available when there's not nets strung along the shore. Yes. Um, Adam, I'm a commercial fisherman based in Oakland. Um, I'm wondering if there's ever been proposals to get uh, more high quality herring for local consumption through either um, seining or cast netting on a virtual level. I have a lot of local restaurants um, that are looking for thin fish this time of year and they're not really interested in the gill netted and pumped herring. And I think we could get them interested in um, small scale seined or cast netted fish. And I was just wonder if there's any ever been any serious um, proposals around. You know, originally there was a certain portion of the fishery, a certain sector in the fishery yeah. years ago. Um, but it sounds like your recommendation is to have some gear options for the fleet or for the fleet yeah. to potentially catch their exactly. hair in a different way. Exactly. So, yeah, it's the same fishery was uh, phased out due to a variety of factors. One of the primary ones is that it was targeted at the class fish, mm -hmm. which, as Sarah talked about, we have. So, herring can come back to the after. So we want to really target those older age classes. So Mount Hall or St. Hens were, were eliminated. Uh, we a proposal for cast setting was brought uh, before the commission, I believe it was in 2013, to allow cast setting as a commercial gear. It's not a commercial gear. Our law enforcement personnel looked at it while I was at that time. Uh, it's going to Take further consideration, CEQA analysis, and to really you know kind of look at that. It would be very difficult from an enforcement standpoint. I don't want to speak for enforcement, but this is one thing that was raised at the time. The difference between a recreational fisherman and a commercial fisherman who's standing in the intertidal zone casting for fish. It also makes it difficult for the biological staff because it is a Florida fishery to monitor that type of catch because currently in regulations uh, you have to have a herring buyer receive those fish. It would set up this additional administrative load where we simply don't have the staff capacity to do that at this point. So that's one of the reasons that it wasn't taken further. We did recognize, however, through the, the stakeholder process, various comments that we received, that there was an interest in that local, you know, local seafood production. So we amended the regulations <laughs> at the time. The fresh fish season had been on what we a shoulder fishery that occurred before the stack row in November, part of November, beginning of December. And then it started again after the stack row fishery ended last part of March, and April, and April. Uh, we amended the regulations so that herring could be taken for fresh fish for the first stack row during the entire season. So it was an effort to allow that you know, opportunity for people to catch herring for fresh. 
fresh fish killed by old markets. Um, you know, as far as the marketing side of it, it's not something the market really steps into. I, I haven't heard a lot of you know, demand, at least I haven't heard much from the marketing associations and from the, the buyers themselves that they're available to buy into these markets. So we're certainly, you know, we're taking all comments. And I think at this point, we'd like to consider everything. So. Um, I have a comment about the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the recreational fishery. I mean, just from the standpoint of uh, practicality, it seems like having a night closure would be good because, first of all, for enforcement, um, it would be you know easier to enforce the, the fishery during the day and what's being taken. And I think it's very important because right now it just seems like Dodge City. It seems like we have actually no idea how much fish the sports sector is taking. I mean, it could be 40 or 50 tons in a, a day or a night. And every fish that we catch is weighed and counted and accounted for. And, you know, we're subject to this FMP and all this type of thing. And I think um, there has to be some way of quantifying, you know, roughly how much fish they're taking and the people are complying with the limit, be it one buck or two. Because, yeah, when we're, yeah, it's been a few years since I was there, but I know when the fish are there, I mean, you look over along the beach and it's splash, splash, splash all <coughs> night, literally all night. And they're shoulder to shoulder on the piers, along the break walls. And that's where the fish are going to spawn. So they're you know, really vulnerable at that stage. Yes. I'm wondering if um, any of your analysis or considerations has taken into account the environmental conditions like the growth of eelgrass in the bay and threats to the growth of eelgrass, like dragon anglers and such, and looking at future planning for the capacity. Um, yes, that's a great question. So <clears throat> due to time constraints, I didn't go into this aspect of the fishery management plan, but a key aspect of this management plan that is different from previous ones is a very robust treatment of um, <clears throat> the habitat that herring utilize throughout their life cycle with a specific emphasis on spawning habitat like eelgrass. Um, and then, uh, so the MLMA requires that habitat, basically that habitat be described and then that um, the impacts to habitat from fishing activities be assessed and then to describe how those are mitigated through management, we are taking it one step further and going beyond what the MLMA requires for fishery management plan to more generally look at the threats to habitat from other uses, not fishing, you know. Um, and so that includes, you know, activities in the bay like dredging and et cetera, anchors. Um, and then, you know, aquaculture um, as a potential um, threat to habitat, things like that. And so the FMP doesn't have a, it doesn't have a lot of authority over these activities that are regulated by other agencies. But what our hope is that this, um, what this chapter will do is it will pro provide a um, sort of a comprehensive place for all of, you know, a su summary of all of the scientific information on the importance of habitat to herring, um, maps showing where herring, ha you know, data that the department has, where herring um, have been documented to utilize these habitats, describing the threats, and then describing the consultation process um, that the department undergoes when an agency approves some sort of activity during, in the bay or a change to activities in the bay. They, um, they usually consult with other agencies that have overlapping jurisdictions and so request a comment. And so what will happen is, you know, an agency that is going, you know, requesting an exemption for dredging work during the winter or, um, you know, wanting to put in aquaculture somewhere will contact the department and ask their biologists to comment. And so what we're hoping is the FMP will be a resource for um, department staff to say, this is a core herring spawning habitat, um, you know, during these times and to, you know, have all the information sort of in one place um, and to hopefully, you know, be able to point to the FMP as, you know, sort of the importance of habitat to the herring life cycle. So that is how we are approaching habitat. You know, we're in this place where 
unfortunately, we can't really control the activities of other agencies, but we are, you know, habitat is a huge piece of the puzzle in terms of maintaining herring sustainability. And unfortunately, the department has somewhat limited jurisdiction over it. Yeah, man. Uh, in sport fishing, uh, the vastness that the amount of herring there are in the bay at times, I mean, the last few years, there hasn't been that big. But uh, in general, and I've been all over it for years, and I don't see that much sport fishing going on. I went across the bay sometimes from Sausalito with a fisherman's wharf and meter carrying all the way across the bay, a band 40 foot thick. And I've never seen that many sport fishing with them, but you can put one iota of a dent in that population. And so to like back off the few sport guys that are even going here to fish, that, that for them to have some interest, like, let's have some interest of the people in the city to even see what they got in the fish. To put further restrictions on it is just ridiculous. They're not putting a dent in those areas. From what I can see. And they can't get to most of the places where they spawn. When they're out in the middle of uh, Richardson Bay, I don't see anybody throwing cast nets out there. When they're over at up Richmond, you know, or Richmond, there's nobody throwing cast nets there. They're, they go up uh, by Hunter's Point. There's maybe a few on one pier or something like that. They can't even get to the places where they are. And so I don't see what restriction on them is you know, any great idea to do with, you got the public there, it's a public resource, the commercial guys are fishing a public resource and then restricting the few guys that are in the public from going fishing and doing something. So I don't see putting a more restriction on it make any sense at all. So I, I think the, uh, the intent was there was just to have some way to quantify what's being done there. And, and so, um, if you have a recommendation that it should be greater than two buckets or it should be status quo, I guess is what I'm looking for a little clarity in your comment. Would you say? Uh, is there anybody quo? ever seeing a guy drag off more than two buckets? I mean, uh, oh, yeah. Pick up loads? I mean, yes. are they loading up, you know, they are loading pick up wheels, but they're they are loading down the barrels. Well, and the, and the issue of, of, you know, selling them too. So that, those are the two issues that would be in balance. One is to still provide that recreational experience, but also the, the concern of, you know, black market. Well, okay. Well, I just, I wouldn't want to uh, you know, discourage the public. Yeah. The intent is not to discourage. The yeah. intent is to put some, you know, reasonable, practical type of, you know, regulations in there. It's going to be okay. The commercialization that's going to take has been raised. Uh, in the past, you know, it comes down to the priorities for the department and, and what our law enforcement staff have time to run down. And that may not always really rise to the top of the list, but there is some commercialization that's going on and that's from probably the national folks. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I see the next biggest problem in the area is going to be the new problem, the new basketball stadium. So they're going to build a, that was where the spawn was. They're going to build a ferry ramp right there and basketball season. So I think someone needs to bring that up as, as a question when they when the city starts building. I'm sure they have a plan for a ferry to come in there at the ramp. And someone from the department needs to question that and so develop because they've already written the items out. Yeah, so just I'll just quickly because this that will be reviewed by <laughs> our review staff. Whatever proposal comes forward, it will go through Becky Hood as the manager of that program. So there will be a review process. I'm not involved with it. I'm not even sure if there's anything we can review at this point, but definitely our staff will be consulted. That staff will then consult our project team as well. So there will be a process. So I've got a question here. And then, uh, um, I was just going to add to the um, discussion on the uh, details or the uh, of what the bag limit might be for recreational. I think. Um, uh, it would be good information, really good and interesting for everybody to know how many are being caught. So, and of course, the only way to do that is to have a limit and you assume pretty much, you can assume that whatever that limit is, every person is going to get it because it's on the day that they were fishing. So you could probably use, once you have a limit, you pretty simple math would tell you how much is being taken. 
roughly. I, I, I agree with you the importance of mention for further management of the fishery. And also, um, some reasonable bag limit would uh, discourage, I'm sure it would be a commercialization. Because then if someone now has two buckets or a small pool or whatever, and they're getting for fresh fish illegally wherever they're selling it, about a pound, I don't even know what they would get, but suddenly it wouldn't be worth it anymore. So yeah, I'm sure you thought that. But, uh, again, it's, it's why I agree there should be some, some bag limit, but uh, please don't do yeah. um, Adrian Klein, San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, also BCDC. Um, we are a sister state agency of CDFW. And I just wanted to let everybody in the room know that that the, if that project that you mentioned, anything that happens in the Bay needs permits from BCDC, and our commission wants to hear from the public because our law and policies protect all the resources of the Bay. Um, and we consult with CFW to make sure that projects don't have adverse impacts. So, if you want to give me your name or contact us through our website, you know, when that project comes forward, please, please do. Yeah, I mean, those projects in the piers, I think everybody understands. Everybody who's been involved, the piers has been all this development. And that's the most vulnerable spot right now. I think, you know, of course, John, John knows. Um, question here? Um, yeah, just a kind of a, an idea that just came up would be to, if you gave a small quota to open access commercial fishermen to address the commercialization, you know, fish go to Chinatown and stuff like that, you might put you guys to work and know exactly what fish was being marketed for local use. Um, and also, you know, in local use of herring, the profile of the fish would be that you have an open hand on the fish that makes money on herring, could benefit in um, this profile being raised locally. So, so your your comments for an open access fishery and an herring fishery very with, small, with some limitations. Very small daily quota, a few hundred pounds a day sort of thing for open access commercial fishing. Would be a build on this. Um, yeah, I just want to just talk about the habitat situation. Um, I think the loss of any spawning, viable spawning habitat in the bay is a serious, serious problem and could lead to bigger problems than anything we could do with a you know, gill net. Because um, there is a very limited uh, amount of spawning habitat, you know, whether it's the proper eelgrass or the salinity or, or whatever it is that they need. So I think that um, that has to be seriously addressed with BCDC and with those folks um, when they're talking about these, these pretty major pro projects that will eliminate spawning habitat. And also I was curious if the steering committee is involved in removal of creosote pilings because I know that those are also a big threat to the viability of the herring as they hatch because of you know the, the oil and so forth. Um, and yeah, I just think you know things like dredging where there were you know manufactured gas plants and all these types of things are pretty serious threats and way more of a threat to any kind of fishery that they do. So I hope that's being addressed seriously. Yeah, I think Sarah spoke to it briefly. There's, there's plans for a, a section of the FMP to sort of address that as, as she said that the authority of the FMP is limited and that mm -hmm. uh, other agencies have their own authorities. Right. But the idea behind this section is that they have an opportunity for people to point to and if maybe they're speaking in another agency that hey, here's a here's recognition of this habitat and the importance it is to the current fishery. Mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a you know, an FMP document, so it might carry a little weight. So the idea is that you'll have that there in place with some assistance to help hopefully change the course of some of these other agencies' direction that could uh, harm that. Yeah, and hopefully they'll be aggressive about it because I know that you know there could be up to 10 or 12 agencies all weighing in on these major projects. But I mean, so it's just a small voice, but. Like I say, the loss of any spawning habitat is serious, has consequences forever. Yeah. It's gone forever. So there has to be some mitigation. Yeah, I just want to, just to clarify though, the steering committee doesn't have any regulatory authority, so they are they're not 
directly to the kind of repository form. Those projects are going on at some state coastal facility. Had some funds from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to go to Creosote Islands around the bay. We're also doing some living reef, uh, living reef and trolling work. So there are projects that are going on that are taking into account spawning habitat and the importance of you know to areas. So those are going on. They're kind of separate processes. And one of the things that the, this chapter on habitat in the FMP, what it does is it summarizes all of the available science that we can find. So like the literature, scientific literature on not just, you know, creosote pilings are bad, but this is why, this is how they affect herring developments. And, um, you know, to, to just provide a little more oomph and to have, you know, so people don't have to go do their research on their own. You know, we want to provide something that these agencies, you know, or other environmental agencies that are interested in this sort of thing can, you know, use as a resource in moving forward. Yeah, there's a lot of that information out there, like from the Costco Sarm stuff, they studied, um, you know, the effects of PAHs on the herring fry. So that, there, there's a lot of that data out there. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, that quota structure. So in the last four years, in eight to fifty, what was the estimated biomass roughly the last four years? Was it all over fifteen thousand tons? Yes. Sir, can you call that? Control rule. Figure. I don't think that's the estimates on this. So it doesn't. It's just so yeah. So 2014-15 was 16,000. <laughs> sorry, vision. 16.7 tons. So 16,700 tons in 2014-15. 2015-2016 was right at 15,000 tons. It was actually 14.9. And then last season was 18,300 uh, tons. And well, then, uh, so all of the other ocean condition <coughs> protocols, I'll call them, that then drive down the quota. Or up. Or up. But if you're, or, you know, if you're coming in at 15,000 and then some ocean protocol comes in, that it will drive it below the 15,000 and then your quota basically. Or does that protocols end? You don't have a protocol affecting it. You know, if there's there's not so many harbor seals, there's this, there's that, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, I mean, you know, if you want the ocean reef perfect all the time, it's never going to be. So it's kind of intuitive or wondering, like, well, you're always going to find something wrong. You know, drive it down. Right. So that area between fifteen. Let me do this out blocking everything. This area here between 15 and 20,000. Our idea, if you notice this, this box of bounder flexibility, that's where the ecosystem considerations come into play. Here, the ecosystem considerations, we're, we're basically saying the ecosystem considerations are accounted for by this low harvest level. We're not going to take them into account to try and adjust that quota because we want to provide consistency for the fleet so that they know, okay, at least so we have this floor, we have 750, you know, as long as the stock's over 15,000. Um, and so this red that I put in here, which I tried to like cross hatch differently to make it different from this, this is, you know, considering ecosystem considerations. This is really meant to be used in extreme conditions only, but it does give the department some way of shutting down the fishery if, you know, really like we were thinking like an oil spill or something like that but so, so we're not yeah we're, we're not looking at considerations i guess that's what how far are those going to go are these well, are you going to always find a spotted owl or somewhere that's what we do. so again it's kind of what the department's doing now so when they you know right now is what they're doing is they're, they're getting the estimated biomass and then they're taking into consideration they're hearing feedback from the, uh, the industry, and then they're setting the quota. So it's, it's, again, it's sort of, we're trying to kind of duplicate what they're doing now, where they have that little bit of flexibility if the ocean conditions are 
or look like they're doing well, good uplines and so on, then they have the ability to raise the quota. And if there's really poor conditions, you know, El Nino uh, predictions or, or something like that, then they would adjust accordingly. But it's giving them the flexibility to move depending on ocean conditions and predictions due to some wind yeah, They just never had that before. Uh, so it's all based on you know, what the quotas are, the quotas are the biomass estimate. So I just don't know why they would that would choose. I'll see. No, no. So anyway, we, that's an, I didn't want to so, so beyond the spawning biomass index that we would look at every year, we would also look at ocean conditions, generally sea surface temperature, upwelling indices. We would look at the stock, the age, age composition of the stock. That was probably the big one. If we saw them, well, I went almost seven, eight, nine, ten years ago now, we saw a truncation where we really weren't seeing those older age classes. That was a red flag that something was going on, not necessarily fishery driven. But it was going on in the ocean. So, are we going to find a spotted owl every year? No, that's not our intent. Our intent is to not kind of qualitatively look at what's going on with all the other bird species, what's going on with the sea surface temperature, with upwelling. Are there four or five red flags that are saying things are bad out there? The stock is depressed. Do we, as a department, need to take additional precautions because other signs are also saying something bad is going on? So hopefully, we don't know, of course, the climate change, what that's going to be in the future. So I'm not going to pretend yeah, well, to know, but you know, we, we just need to have that flexibility to look at those conditions. Well, I just wanted to state that for general yeah. comment. You know, other things that are important. If you had applied these regulations to previous seasons, how many times would sea conditions have reduced the quota below the black hole? So that's an excellent question, and I wish we could do that, but we don't have the, so the um, alternative forage index that I mentioned, that has only recently been put together. And again, this ecosystem science thing is totally new and emerging, and so all agencies are trying to like figure out how to operationalize it. So, but it would be super interesting if we had that data going back to look at that. Rebecca schwartz lesberg I'm with Coastal Policy Solutions in Audubon. Um, this might be very similar to what we're discussing, but I wanted to ask from a slightly different perspective. But I know the FMP doesn't have jurisdiction over actions of other agencies that might be impacting local conditions in the bay. But if something were to happen that did destroy local habitat, like if there was a, a big impact to bluegrass or to the bay, would that be the type of ecosystem consideration that could change this quota below that black line on that the, the local level rather than the large scale ecosystem conditions look like SST. In my opinion, yes, because that's sort of the kind of thing that we talked about that we envisioned when, you know, so currently the department can institute an emergency closure. And so conditions under which they might do that would be some sort of very dramatic you know, something happening like an oil spill or some other sort of damage on that scale. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I do believe that that would be something that would fall under this. That's not different from the way this department currently manages now because they currently can, you know, if there's an oil spill, you guys probably shut down your season. Yeah, I think there's a bit of an asterisk to that though because I know what you're asking about specifically is the spawning habitat in the Bay. Mm -hmm. We would not make an adjustment to it based on Polar creek capacity because we've seen it has a very cyclical nature where it, it's ups and downs. Now, why I say it would not necessarily affect the quota is because herring, while they do seem to have a preferential, you know, like, well, they do tend to preferentially spawn on the grass, they also spawn on a variety of other habitats. They spawn on red algae, they spawn on other tidal zones, they spawn on pure pockets, <coughs> low bottoms. If wherever they're spawning is in water, it's fair game for spawning. So I wouldn't want to overstate that we could close a fishery because or curtail the quota because of the gas production or the gas production is not as big as it can be. We still very much I just don't think we would have enough science to support that kind of type of thing. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, when you say close the fishery, oops. Oh, sorry, my name is Stephanie Webb and I'm at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I was just curious, when you say you're gonna close a fishery, does that mean, you close, if it gets closed, 
Is that for commercial and recreation? Or does that just a closure only apply to commercial? Um, so that is a good question. So we have talked about that at the steering committee level a little bit, but we haven't come to a formal decision because, so on the one hand, there is a desire to maintain parity across all the sectors. Um, on the other hand, the, you know, our understanding of the way that it, this fishery works is that, you know, the gillnut fleet is really sort of the, the largest, you know, has the largest impact on, on herring in terms of removals. And so it's something that we need to explore further. But um, yeah, so we haven't come up with a, a recommendation on it, but the FMP will address sort of how, how access changes, you know, and if it's the same across the board with this harvest control rule or not. Um, I thought I'd introduce myself and fly over here. So Biden and I are two of the members of the four member steering committee. Um, and the idea of the steering committee, um, uh, in case uh, it wasn't completely clear from what Sarah was presenting, is that uh, conservation and industry representatives come up with the um, review FMP products and come up with um, hopefully unified recommendations to, to this uh, project team and, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, with the goal being that once this plan gets to the Fish and Game Commission, that we're all in agreement, that uh, all the, the stakeholders will come in with a unified support for the fishery management plan. So that's our goal, and I'm really proud that we're, we've achieved that so far. And uh, we fully expect that will be the case this October, right, bud? Yeah. Um, and so the other thing I want to mention is that um, part of my job is on the two conservation apps, along with Dr. Jeff Shuster at Oceana, is to communicate regularly with other environmental groups, um, NRDC, National Resource Defense Council, um, Ocean Conservancy, Earth Justice, the Pew Trust, and other groups that are interested in this fishery management plan um, for a bunch of reasons to protect fish and predators, but also support a, a, um, a vibrant, you know, continuing commercial fishery. And so I'm, I can report to you that uh, we've, uh, Jeff and I have communicated with all these groups, and all these groups are in support of this management framework. So we don't expect any problems until we get to the commission from a variety of, of conservation groups that communicate with. So, uh, and I just want to say I'm always available as a steering committee member um, representing conservation groups questions at the table. Um, easy to find the Audubon, California. It's Honor Weinstein, the Audubon, California. And then Terrell Gennaro over there, hiding in the corner, representing the fleet. Did you mention Nick? That's why I did. Did you mention Nick as well? Uh, well, Nick's not here, but yeah. Yeah, Nick Sorokoff yeah. is the other, yeah. So there's two industry reps, but is one, Nick Sorokoff, who's also the chairman. Director's Committee Advisory Committee. Although technically, I think he's co chair, as Sam LeBron pointed out last week. <laughs> as, as, as Sarah mentioned, uh, we had a similar presentation to industry permit holders um, a couple weeks ago, and, and there were several comments that were made that we uh, wanted to uh, bring back to the steering committee for um, additional thoughts and considerations. Um, other other questions, comments, comments concerns, concerns, questions. Yeah, actually, I heard one uh, comment from Sarah about gear restrictions. As far as I know, you know, there's no no sport fisherman can use a gill net in the taking of any any fish. Is that true? I think that is true because different code specifies. That gill nets can't be used for recreational. Right. So it's just I think you're right. that the sports have a pretty limited selection of gear that they can lawfully use to take game fish. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what we would intend though is just to specify what's allowed here, because currently it's not very inclusive of herring. So we would usually what's how we're going to do it is what we can't use. Okay. Quick question. I'm just curious what happens if the number of permits falls below a certain number? Is there some mechanism to issue more permits? Or, I mean, the way I understand it now is it takes four permits to fish two nets. So, if you have one permit, then 
I mean, she could fish a half a net. Is that how it works? Yeah. And then, yes. So there's we'll some flexibility in that if it falls below a certain level. There will be, and this is still to be flushed out, but we, we do intend to describe a process where we fall below that max cap, of whether it's 40 or 30 permits, when we help get your tier consolidation. There will be a process of how those new permits will be issued as a new trial. So it'll be specified in the regulation where it can be aligned. But we're still working. It'd be pretty hard to make a living with one net, like half a net. Yeah, no, the intention is not to fish with one net. Right. It's from an enforcement standpoint, these guys would probably kill me. <laughs> it's, just, it's not practical to, to try to, we have a standard description for a fish, right? Commercial field net must be this. Mm -hmm. We don't want to fish with that. Yeah, they have to buy a new tape measure. Right, right. The yardstick. Right, I know. So we did, when we explained this, the proposed regulatory changes to the fleet, we went into a lot of detail about how exactly these changes would take place, you know, such that it's maintaining everyone's access to the fishery. And so while we use, you know, the idea of a half a net, really the way we're thinking about it is it, it takes four permits assigned to a boat in order to fish two nets every week of the season. That's the way it is now. That's the way it will be. And so, yeah, I, the, while we did sort of refer to you know a permit being equal to half a net under that system, we're not intending that anyone fish with half a net. You know, currently you would just assign your permit to a boat, and hopefully there's other permits on that boat <laughs> so that you can get to well, yeah, one I mean, to two if, nets. I mean, what if like I have one to a net? What if um, you know the you couldn't get three other permits because they either weren't available or people wanted too much money to rent them. I mean, you'd have to be able to fish for the half of that. I mean, it's like, well, so the question that, for that, you, could, that could happen. Yeah, a question back to you then are you currently fishing with one net every week with your one permit? No, I mean, I've been fish pairing for about three or four years. You know, I'm fishing kind yeah. of nice crabs right now. But I mean, I, yeah, I always rented enough permits so that I had a full complement of that. So that was the feedback that we were getting is nobody's realistically doing that. And so that they would, you know, it, it didn't make sense to fish with one net every other week, so that people are making that effort to get a full complement. And so we're just we're just going along with the intent of the industry to um, maximize their opportunity to full complement. Well, you just have to leave the flexibility there. I mean, I do know people that fish one net. You know that they don't want to rent the permits, and they do fine fishing one net. I mean, a half net, probably not. But I mean, you have to. In order to make a living fishing, you have to have you know, different options. And some years, herring fishing is a good option. You know, I, I mean, you know, if, if they do figure out some way of marketing the fish for people to, for consumption, then it could be, you know, you could make a little money with a half net, you know, for the fresh market or something like that. So it's just, but it doesn't sound like this is going to preclude that. You're just, I mean, it's not, there's not going to be some law where you have to have four permits, is there? No, but because we don't have any provision in the regulations for to specify a half a net, you do need to have two permits on a boat under this new system. To, oh, okay. So to, then you could fish one net for the entire season if yep. you have two permits. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Yeah, so we are, you know, we have this consolida consolidation mechanism that, you know, eventually the idea is that we would get to this four, per, you know, four permits per boat, and those can just turn into a single permit. But we recognize we want to maintain access, and we want to do this transition slowly and in a way that doesn't kick people out of the fishery. And so, you know, for the foreseeable future, you know, the way that we envision access is, you know, as long as you can get another <coughs> permit to fish with, and you guys can fish every week of the season, you know, with that one that. But it seems like when, by the time you, this gets to the commission and you're proposing it to them, then from what you're saying, it would have to be in the code where you have to have two permits to participate in the area development fishery. Yes. Which, you know. Going forward, yeah. That's, that's kind of a bit of a tough one because if I own a permit, if I own a permit, then I'm not allowed to fish unless I either buy another permit or rent one, but, which would be tough for me to well, deal with the possible. I mean, I, I'm not saying that. That'll occur. I'm just 
kind of looking ahead and mm -hmm. potential problems. Yes, and I do, you know, certainly anytime we make regulatory changes, you know, like everyone's impacted differently. One of the things that has given us a little bit of confidence in this moving forward is that currently, um, you know, permits are pretty available. I think that a the department is reissuing permits currently. Is that true? I think a couple have. A couple of because they've fallen below the cap in We're San Francisco, process. San Francisco Bay. So that means that you can just apply to the department for another permit. Um, additionally, from what I've heard from the fleet, it seems like there are plenty of people who are looking to offload a permit. Oh, yeah, so, right now. Yeah. There's no money in it. There. Right. There used to be a lot of money in it. It's really hard to get a permit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, this wasn't a, we didn't develop this concept in a vacuum. It came from what we talked about. It came from the PHAS that worked on some kind of permit so we recognize that there will unfortunately probably be, I don't want to say that there's winners losers because that's not exactly the popular, but it will impact some people more than others. And it was just unfortunately a side effect of just trying to simplify the system. Initially it's going to be messy, but it ultimately we hope to get to a, a simple system that's on the track with some of the state for everything. Yeah. Uh, well, CH permits. Those are two permits. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if there being any resolution on that, I might be surprised. When they developed that, it was two permits for one. It was a, a senior representative that they were so disgusted that they were the seniors were being taken out of the fishery that I. True values of it. Uh, really, it should have been its direct values across were more of uh, four to one, and they ended up with two to one. And then they ended up with, if they sold it, it turned into one. And they truly had the same quotas prior to that. Yeah. You could buy and sell and purchase them by the time you purchase um, So, what do you do with that? Well, well CH4 will still be treated as two permits. Mm -hmm. that, that will not change. Um, of course, we will go back in time and try to interpret those exchanges, but no, no, CH permits will remain in two. will be still operate as two. Like, CH permits will operate as two. You know, will still be assigned two to two. So what would get back to two to two? We'll still have to get a fish one hand. Right. So, Well, the kelpers didn't argue. Most of the kelpers were seeing it at the time. Um, I was a representative of those. But, uh, so I don't know how, how does that affect the well on the for one day. And then the other would be that they made them, you know, they, they changed to one if you sold it. So the value of them if you sell it. So that's a this is a fisheries management plan. You're changing roles. So, is it a time to change the roles that you can actually sell a CH permit and still carry the value of the two? So, so once, so when this new system goes into effect, all of the current odds and even permits will get translated into what we're calling a standardized tier one permit. And so, that's that's what. We were talking about with this, you know, every each one of those permits is worth technically worth half a net. You need four of them on board to fish. CHs will get trans transferred to be two of those tier one permits. Once that transfer happens, they they stay that way forever. So it's two tier one permits. The holder will have those. The holder can sell both of those um, tier one permits. But going forward, we won't track who used to be a CH or not. So in that way, so basically a CH will be two permits. You can sell each of those permits if you want. Um, so does that answer your question for the gillnet part of it? Uh, yeah. Okay. It loses its designation. Yeah. It'll no longer be a B, it'll no longer be H, it'll no longer be a CH. It will just be a mm -hmm. 
and they'll all be the same. So yeah, odd even all that stuff. Ultimately, we hope to get to the one of CH will just be a tier one. Two tier ones. Two tier ones. So it'd be potentially you could buy four even permits. You could have four even permits in the yeah, that'd be all yeah. mm -hmm. Um for the eggs on kelp sector, we have not discussed what exactly we have discussed. We haven't come to a conclusion on how exactly to um, the how the proposed changes in the gillnet sector are will affect the um, eggs on kelp permits. And so again, there's a desire to maintain sort of parity across these different sectors. Um, and so we're still working on that. But um, yeah, so I don't have a good answer for you on the eggs on kelp part yet. We will email them. Any time. Other comments or questions? Uh, that time, I think we have uh, 2.31. And also just to, we, you know, we are taking any uh, written comments or if you think of something after the meeting today that you want to include by, by the thing that you're part of. Yeah, you can send it to me. Is this presentation online somewhere? It will be. It will be. So um, I think that we will be posting a link to, so Ryan, if you're not familiar, Ryan runs a blog that provides updates on the herring, and management of herring. Whatever's going on that I have time to put out. <laughs> and so I think that we will use that blog as a forum to um, post a link to this meeting. And so, um, and potentially a copy of the presentation as well. Um, but so, um, as, I, as we mentioned, so we have been webcasting this and also recording it. And so, um, if you know anyone who was interested in what we talked about or wants to see the presentation or, or listen to the meeting and listen to the comments, that will be available via a YouTube link on the Herring blog. And Sarah, can you go back to the time frame slide you had? Also yeah. So these guys have an idea of when the response would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's multiple ways to comment. Um, but here's the, uh, the timeline. Out of way. I believe that there's another um, steering committee meeting in February. Yep, mid-February. Mid all these comments. And so, so the comments now and before that meeting in February can be taken into account and considered by the steering committee. And then uh, beyond that, then once the steering committee, you know, moves it forward into you know peer review and then through the uh, the commission process, then then you can make comments directly to the to the fish and game commission as well. So I think that's going to be a couple of different op opportunities where you can comment. And so yeah, we're hoping to get assuming we stay on track with everything else, which we're going to do. <laughs> Uh, we plan to go to the first commission meeting for the fishery management plan will be at the October meeting, and that'll be what's called a notice hearing. That will then formally start again a, a formal comment period. We hope to be at the December meeting for the final, what we call the discussion and adoption hearing. So through that time period, there'll be about you know, four months, three, four months, the, the commission will be taking comments um, in addition to what we're what we're really trying to do is kind of load everything up in the beginning, let everyone know what we're doing, make sure that everyone feels like they're being heard and that we're considering all options for folks to Any other Well, if we don't have any other comments here, um, we'll go ahead and conclude this meeting. And, and uh, again, Ryan, I'll make this email available to you guys if you want to uh, send in any future comments. But, I want to thank you guys all for coming. I know it takes time out of your day, but it's really important to uh, for us to hear these comments and bring them back to the steering committee for, for consideration. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.